Yeah, it's a great pleasure to have Professor Daniele Uriti from Arnold Sommerfeld Center for Theoretical Physics, Munich Center for Mathematical Philosophy, Center for Advanced Studies, which is a part of LMU Munich. And uh, I know the speaker from Max Planck Institute, Gravity. He was here for a longer time. And there was an overlap of like one and a half years. So I saw him many times. So it's a great pleasure to have in the uh, quantum aspects of space, time, and matter seminar series. And uh, thank you for your time. And uh, uh, today we hope to learn about uh, what is space and what is time and the quest for quantum gravity. And uh, Professor Oriti, please. Yeah, you can. Yeah, so thanks a lot for the invitation and the opportunity to give this talk. Uh, I have to alert you that my goal is much more modest than, uh, than what uh, our host uh, just said. I'm not going to explain to you what is space and what is time because that is the object of uh, the quest for quantum gravity. I hope just to uh, give you a good feeling for what the quest is about and uh, what are the various aspects related to um, quantum gravity. So. I also have to alert you that the talk is, to, is going to be very general, only towards the end I'm going to discuss some more recent uh, technical work uh, uh, that I've been involved in. Uh, but uh, feel free to ask uh, questions about anything I'm going to say in the following, uh, especially the more technical part at the end. So let me start. So we have to start from what we know about uh, physical space and time. If we want to understand in what sense we need uh, and we want to go beyond that. Uh, so I recapitulate a few hundreds uh, years of uh, history about uh, uh, the search for the nature of space and time in, in just uh, one slide here and a couple more slides afterwards. So. Yeah, the first thing one has to appreciate is uh, how we moved from a conception of uh, space and time in which uh, there are physical referred temporal uh, directions and uh, space and time were absolute uh, entities, meaning that uh, they were physical, they were affecting, uh, they, they were entering the description of physical systems and affecting them, but they were not dynamical. They were, and, uh, and not, they were not subject to equations of motions themselves, and uh, they were not subject to the influence of other physical entities, uh, particles, fields, and so on. Uh, the description in Newtonian physics uh, of space and time was uh, as a continuum, uh, but the preferred uh, temporal direction came with the preferred foliation of what would now recognize as a space-time manifold. That already changed in special relativity. What didn't change was the absolute nature of space-time, but uh, we realized that uh, measurements of uh, spatial distances and uh, temporal intervals uh, could uh, uh, morph into one another. Uh, so again, space and time were physical, needed to be treated together, but they, were, they remained non-dynamical and not subject to the influence of uh, other entities. Still, the description was in terms of a continuum uh, structure, subject to a modified version of the uh, relativity of inertial frames compared to Newtonian physics. So this, of course, is something you know very well. I want to emphasize all, uh, only the absolute nature of space-time and the continuum nature that we uh, carried forward from Newtonian physics. This that changed. Yeah. You have drawn. It's a new new to new Newtonian something. The in the previous slide. Yeah. So what is that neo Newtonian space time? Oh, it's just that uh, I refer to neo Newtonian in the sense that uh, it's a reformulation on start of Newtonian physics uh, in the mathematical language that uh, was developed afterwards and uh, in which we talk about uh, you know uh, space-time manifold and foliations and so on so it's like uh, formulated as a particular case uh, of uh, the more general framework that we use already in uh, special relativity and uh, general relativity okay. okay nothing deeper than that okay. at least in my in my presentation so um we know that uh, 
space and time are very well described by general relativity. And in fact, we use it as a basis for our description of uh, astrophysics and cosmology. And uh, uh, we use it because it works. It predicts a new phenomena and it is extremely well tested. And uh, you know very well the Einstein's equations relating uh, you know, the distribution of matter uh, and other um, uh, fields uh, in space time with the geometry of space and time. So it's a description for cosmology, for astrophysics. And let me just emphasize the main lesson because uh, it's in terms of this main lesson that uh, uh, we best understand, in my opinion, the quest for quantum gravity. So first of all, the gravitational interaction is described uh, at least macroscopically by the geometry of space-time. And this means, uh, and it, we keep using the continuum local picture of space-time uh, that we use also, that we're using also in special relativity. And we have the Einstein's equations relating the dynamics of space-time itself and its geometry to the dynamics of matter and other fields other interaction fields. The main lesson in one sentence is that we have learned that uh, space-time itself is a physical system. This is uh, of, uh, uh, I mean, it cannot be um, uh, overly stressed. Moreover, it, the identification of the gravitational interaction with the geometry of space-time means that a deeper understanding of gravity is in fact a deeper understanding of space and time themselves. So improving our understanding of gravity, going to a better theory like a quantum theory of gravity is supposed to be, uh, means uh, improving our understanding uh, of space and time themselves. So because it's an important point, I repeat it in two slides. Um, and uh, just to a physical system. Ah, Alexandre, agora tô. Hello, sorry. Hello, if you have any question, please ask the speaker. Okay. Uh, if it was not a question, I'll I'll I'll, I'll go ahead. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, so really this is the first lesson we bring uh, forward. If we go a little bit more in detail about uh, uh, how space and time are dealt with in general relativity, we recognize that uh, uh, notions of space and time are encoded in a number of structures. Uh, the topological manifold, the differentiable structure, the continuum metric field, and in fact also matter and gauge fields. The, uh, the one key ingredient of general relativity is the fact that we only allow for dynamical fields, every field that enters uh, in the, uh, from the formulation of the theory, unless we're dealing with very special solutions and restrictions are dynamical, they're subject to their own uh, equations of motion, including the metric, including the geometry of space-time. And the diffeomorphism invariance basically is a way of uh, naturally encoding the requirement that there's no preferred temporal or spatial directions in general. So at, at least you go to some special solutions. It also implies uh, that uh, we cannot attribute a direct physical meaning to manifold points or paths on the manifolds as such. So we have to give meaning to uh, points in space-time or uh, the using, uh, we have to uh, make them physical by defining them uh, through the use of dynamical fields, including the metric itself. So still we have a, a, a local and a a description of the physical universe in terms of well-defined notions of space and time, and this is what we uh, what we describe in the in the language of uh, local quantum field theory. Okay, when we decide to move forward to go to some uh, different theory, we have to keep in mind all these space-time structures because uh, it will be our choice ultimately. And okay, uh, it's a matter of experimental uh, um, uh, test. Uh, which of these structures has to be uh, left untouched and which one has to be modified uh, maybe radically. So uh, this is just the picture. So let me now try to convey what the problem, what the ver various uh, uh, facets of the problem of quantum gravity are. So let me start with some conceptual motivations. So one way to 
pose uh, uh, the um, uh, question about uh, why we need to go beyond generativity and quantum field theory to go towards uh, quantum theory of gravity. It's simply that uh, uh, these two pillars of uh, modern physics uh, are uh, incompatible conceptually, in particular in the way they deal with space and time. I don't go and uh, list and discuss each of the aspects you know very well. The point is that if we simply ask uh, what modern physics tell us about uh, space and time, about their nature, well, uh, the answer will be drastically different if we rely on the quantum field theory picture of the world in, in its basic ingredients, or if you rely on the generalistic picture. In one, space-time is dynamical, as I said, it's treated as a physical system. In the other, quantum field theory, it is not. Uh, in one case, uh, we deal with the world uh, without assuming uh, uh, any preferred temporal spatial direction. And in quantum field theory, uh, the uh, preferred temporal direction uh, is uh, um, it's, uh, crucial to define uh, unitarity, to have a good notion of evolution, and so on. So I, again, as I said, I don't go through everything. The point is that we are left with a rather schizophrenic uh, um, view of the world, and in particular, space and time. And conceptually, this is not a good uh, uh, situation to be in. What, so uh, uh, I have to clap. You you did <laughs> an excellent job to make make the slides. Sorry, say it again. Your slides are excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the picture is not uh, my drawing anyway, <laughs> so I cannot I cannot take credit. Uh, so again, at the conceptual level, I, let me just uh, uh, repeat one point to take on board uh, for the following: that uh, uh, we have learned that uh, space and time are physical and they are dynamical physical systems from uh, GR, and uh, we now realize uh, simply by comparing the treatment uh, uh, given in GR with the treatment of the same system given in the rest of physics uh, that uh, uh, we do not have a coherent fundamental understanding of what they are. And we have to realize that the moment we start asking more questions about the nature of space and time themselves, uh, we, we are trying to, uh, sort of the moment we try to ask for a better theory and a better understanding of gravity, we're really asking about a better understanding of uh, space and time themselves. And uh, I make just one, inf one deduction from this, which is that uh, um, the moment you think about space and time, uh, you have to learn to think uh, the world uh, without assuming uh, any given notion of space and time, because that's exactly the object of your inquiry. That's um, that motivates uh, the picture of Kant in a not standard uh, uh, disguise. So we are physicists uh, anyway, and so we need we better have a lot of physical motivations to go uh, to embark into such a quest for a. A more fundamental theory of gravity and space-time. So I list uh, a few reasons, a few open physical issues that uh, motivate uh, the quest. None of this motivation amounts to a proof. There could be solutions in principle that do not involve uh, quantum gravity, but uh, they are, as a matter of fact, uh, taken to be strong motivations for a theory of quantum gravity, for the search for a theory of quantum gravity. Uh, so the first uh, is the well-known uh, breakdown of GR, uh, at the uh, so-called singularities, space-time singularities, uh, that is for very strong uh, gravitational fields, large energy densities, and so on. And uh, the, the point is that in GR, uh, they are inevitable under some reasonable assumptions, which again can be questioned, but uh, they are rather, rather uh, natural and reasonable. So, and uh, the singularities do not occur in uh, um, systems that we uh, uh, can nothing about, uh, because according to the best theory we have, that is GR, a singularity sits at the center of uh, every single one of the black holes uh, we think we see uh, in, the, uh, in the sky. And uh, uh, one singularity, a very important one, sits at the, in the very early universe, uh, for all we know. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so 
it's hard to deny that uh, uh, the universe is an interesting physical system. Um, another motivation is the, uh, for some people, at least, is the divergences in quantum field theories. And because they are related to high energies, uh, this uh, uh, suspicion is that uh, you know, a quantum theory of gravity would at the very least uh, modify our treatment and our understanding of the uh, same divergences, uh, although it may not directly cure them as a matter of necessity. Uh, hello. More practic yeah. I have a question here. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, like purely in the framework of quantum field theory, uh, is there any motivation that we expect space time to uh, react to high energies? Well, that is already something we expect uh, in. Uh, uh, so, we expect space time to react to any energy uh, just because of GR. Now, of course, if the energies are not very high, then the uh, deformation of uh, geometry and space-time that follows would be uh, totally negligible. But at least, uh, unless uh, you know, GR breaks down in a in a very strange manner, we expect that the moment uh, high energies are involved, uh, high energy densities more precisely, that will induce uh, some uh, uh, deeper deformation of the geometry, some some high curvature being produced. So I would say just, uh, you know, the, the, what we learn and what we imply from what we know from GR. Okay, okay. Thank you. And, um, okay, so even more practically, uh, we could try to uh, patch up the, the two theories to combine them uh, in the sort of a brute force or, or uh, you know, not particularly deep manner without requiring drastic modifications of any of the two. So we can just try to extract an effectively classical quantity for the energy momentum tensor from quantum field theory and use it as a source uh, in classical GR. Uh, this is a semi-classical gravity. The point is that uh, this works very well in a number of approximations. It is routinely used in uh, cosmology and astrophysics, uh, but we know from a number of uh, uh, results uh, that it, it is not a fully consistent uh, nor a fundamental theory. It is at best a very useful and uh, rather successful approximation. So we are still lacking for a, a more consistent, complete uh, uh, theory. Let me keep going, a bunch of other motivations. Uh, because of the breakdown of GR and the lack of a consistent uh, framework for uh, quantum fields uh, and uh, gravity and geometry, and space-time geometry, a bunch of questions that are uh, rather natural in uh, primordial cosmology are simply uh, not answerable at the moment. So we simply do not know what happens to quantum fields close to the Big Bang. And uh, we do not really know what generates uh, uh, cosmological fluctuations uh, uh, in the sense that uh, you know we can of course model them, but we do not have a fully consistent theory of uh, about them. In fact, I will illustrate later on in what ways uh, uh, existing cosmological paradigms uh, rely on a number of assumptions and suggestions uh, uh, for uh, what happens uh, to quant what quantum gravity gives in the very early universe. Um, and a second set of, another set of uh, uh, motivations come from black hole thermodynamics. We know that uh, black holes uh, are uh, thermodynamic objects in the sense that we have a consistent description of the uh, laws of black hole mechanics uh, understood uh, in the language as uh, uh, black hole thermodynamics. So we have a well-defined notion of entropy associated to them. Uh, we have a temperature uh, for, for them, the Hawking temperature and so on. Let me just, uh, 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 stress a couple of points here. So already the notion of entropy is quite radical when you associate it to black holes. First of all, uh, uh, the moment you associate it to black holes, you're basically associating it to uh, what is, in a sense, uh, in general activity, nothing more than uh, a certain space-time region. So you're basically saying that the space-time itself, at least some region of space-time, can be attributed an entropy. And first of all, uh, because of the continuum nature of space-time, uh, if you were just counting the degrees of freedom of uh, the gravitational field, uh, uh, that would, should come out infinite. Second, we don't really understand why it scales with the area, so why it's holographic. 
And moreover, if it is a Boltzmann type, so what you're counting is really degrees of freedom, then you immediately ask uh, what is the microstructure of that region of space-time that you are accounting for macroscopically when you state uh, a number, which is the entropy. Uh, and then the moment uh, you realize uh, through the Hawking uh, result uh, that black holes emit uh, thermal radiation, uh, then uh, uh, it's clear that they evaporate away and we simply do not know what happens at the end of this evaporation uh, process and in particular what happens to the information content that was uh, stored in a way inside the space-time region that we call a black hole. So we don't know what the solution is to this, uh, to this question, to this uh, puzzle, but uh, all the proposed solutions uh, signal some violation of, of uh, one or the other basic principle of uh, usual space-time physics. So again, we're back to the question, we, don't, we seem to not really know what is uh, space-time at the more fundamental level. And that is, again, is a motivation for the quest for quantum gravity. If this was not radical enough, well, we learned in the past uh, 20 years or so, uh, even more actually, uh, a bunch of other lessons from disparate corners of uh, theoretical physics. I mentioned two. This notion that uh, black holes have, have, uh, can be understood as thermodynamic object has been suggested to, uh, for, first of all, to generalize to any type of horizon, including cosmological horizons and so on. Uh, second, it has been suggested, and there are some good reasons for it, uh, that uh, uh, any region of space-time can be understood as a thermodynamic uh, uh, system. So space-time itself could be a thermodynamic system. And this led, uh, 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 if not historically, it, it, leads, it leads now to, to study those results. Uh, it led a number of people to try to derive and reinterpret uh, the equations of general relativity themselves as a restatement in geometric language, in the language of fields, uh, of space-time fields, uh, or what are basically laws of thermodynamics for some unknown uh, microscopic degree of freedom constituting space-time. And uh, related to this, uh, at least conceptually, is the a large number of results uh, that uh, in condensed matter systems have shown that an effective um, uh, description of the excitations over um, some uh, um, uh, macroscopic solutions of the of the condensed matter systems themselves uh, can be described uh, in the language of uh, quantum field theory on a curved geometry. So there is some effective uh, curved geometry over which uh, quasi particles, uh, you know, waves on, on fluids uh, move, and that has produced in a way by the quantum interactions of the underlying atomic uh, degrees of freedom, even though uh, there was no curved geometry, no generativistic effect uh, to start with uh, in the initial microscopic description of the system. So this motivated the uh, analogy with, uh, um, so the idea that uh, gravity itself could be an emergent phenomenon. So this uh, suggests that maybe space-time themselves uh, could be, uh, uh, itself uh, could be a collective emergent entity from uh, some non-space-time uh, uh, degrees of freedom. Okay, so there are a number of uh, uh, hints uh, that this could be a fruitful uh, line of investigation. And uh, so what are they suggesting? So they're suggesting that there is some fundamental breakdown of the local continuum maybe some fundamental discreteness for space-time and uh, possibly a, a truly emergent nature of, of the very notions of space and time from uh, building blocks, uh, quantum building blocks, uh, quantum entities, which are not themselves described in any usual uh, uh, spatial-temporal or geometric language. We will see in the following that this idea is actually supported by results uh, in uh, a number of contemporary quantum gravity formalism. So on top of the motivation coming from other uh, corners of theoretical physics and semi-classical gravity in particular, we have uh, uh, motivations to adopt uh, this type of picture uh, from a number of quantum gravity formalism themselves. So this is another picture that simply uh, discuss, uh, simply supposed to illustrate uh, uh, the disappearance uh, of uh, space and time at the fundamental level into some uh, uh, non-standard building block. Uh, 
the point is, the moment you adopt uh, this picture of uh, space-time as emergent, well, then you have to start questioning uh, a number of uh, uh, standard, uh, commonly assumed notions of space-time physics, including locality, the notion of separation of scales, and so on. This means uh, that uh, if that's what the fundamental theory looks like, uh, so if, if, uh, if the fundamental theory is not based on a notion of space and time, and uh, these notions will only be emergent uh, as approximate collective uh, notions, well, then it could well be that uh, even uh, phenomena that are currently puzzling from the point of view of in, in our usual description of local space-time physics, uh, that we do not uh, normally attribute uh, to any microscopic uh, quantum gravity effect, uh, could actually be the result uh, at large scales of uh, an underlying uh, uh, quantum gravity physics. Um, and uh, I list dark matter, but in particular, dark energy has been suggested to be a large scale manifestation of what is really some microscopic uh, quantum gravity physics. So, this is for the motivation. Suppose you agree with the motivation and you start wondering uh, uh, well, okay, how is this quantum gravity theory, whatever it is in details, uh, uh, how is it supposed to look like in very general uh, terms? What should we expect from it? Well, at the bare minimum, uh, what quantum gravity should be, uh, it's uh, some quantized version of classical gravity, so some quantized version of the best theory we have of classical gravity that is general relativity. And you should realize that even if that's the only thing there is to quantum gravity, some you know, putting hats on uh, classical quantities, having operators describing geometry, acting on some Hilbert space, and uh, you know, um, from which we have uh, some quantum description of uh, any geometric observable, this is going to be uh, very much uh, radical in its implications already. Just imagine what will implies to have quantum fluctuations, quantum superpositions of uh, the standard uh, space-time structures we describe in terms of a metric field, now to be turned into some operator. So the geometry, meaning any quantity you measure, like the uh, area of a uh, surface of a table, the volume uh, of space enclosed in a given room behind a set of walls, uh, the curvature where you sit, uh, should be subject to quantum fluctuations. Uh, questioning uh, what is their value will have uh, probabilistic answers in general. Then uh, uh, geometry is almost equivalent to causality. So to ask uh, uh, whether uh, two events uh, in, in space-time are uh, uh, causally related, whether one can influence the other causally or not, uh, or has been influenced by the other causally, well, it will itself be subject to quantum fluctuations and have a probabilistic answer. A priori, the topology of space and space-time could fluctuate. The dimensionality of space and time could fluctuate, or space-time could fluctuate. So this should be obviously that, radical. Can you please yeah? on this uh, topological fluctuation and dimensionality a bit mm -hmm. more? Uh, you want you yeah. need to say more? I didn't hear. Yeah, so like, uh, what do you mean by dimensionality here exactly? Because like, uh, once you talk about this metric, you can take any arbitrary dimension. Yeah, the point is that uh, you can formulate uh, your classical theory and therefore the quantum theory in any you know, uh, sort of kinematical dimension your setup. But then the actual dimensionality of uh, space-time should be the result of measurements. So you would measure quantities like, uh, I don't know, the volume of, of a room or how the volume scales with the distance, with the radius, or uh, uh, you will study some uh, you know, physical process uh, uh, and uh, check uh, how the correlation function scales with the distance. All this stuff is actually implicitly in the formalism a function of the dimension of space-time. Yeah. So because all these quantities are actually the result of measurements, which uh, dimensionality for space-time you're going to infer from measurements will be subject to fluctuations and uh, you know, the quantum nature of the same geometric quantities. Mm 
Yeah. In fact, I know we know from a fact uh, that in a number of quantum gravity approaches, even though you may start with uh, you know basic structures which you interpret at first as I don't know four dimensional building blocks of uh, sure. space time, the actual effective dimension you, you obtain for some geometric quantities will be can be lower we see the phenomena like dimensional flow in which you know at high energy effectively space time looks uh, lower dimensional yeah. and things like this i'm just pointing out uh, that uh, already when you uh, quantize uh, uh, classical some classical version of uh, a gravitational theory like gr already radical modifications of the usual understanding of space time should be expected which one is realized or not, okay, it will depend on the formalism, first of all, and then on experiments. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have another question. Yeah. yeah. So, like, can we make any comment about whether dimensions could be fractional here? Sorry, whether dimension could be? Like, uh, can we make any comment whether the space time dimension, the dimensionality, could be fractional or is it bound to oh, be of natural course. number? Well, there's no, I mean, in many of the examples we know of, uh, you know, an effective dimensionality, which is not, which is not just uh, the four, the number four you put in your kinematical uh, structures when writing down the, the equations. Uh, in general, it is in fact uh, fractional. In fact, fractal in many cases. Is, okay. uh, but there's no, I mean, I, I'm just listing possibilities here. Which one is more likely? Which result is more solid? Uh, it would be, you know, a longer discussion. I can tell you, I'm happy to discuss it. But uh, my point here, just to say, state that uh, when we say space time is four dimensional, unless we are Platonist and we just say, oh, because we define things in a manifold, you know, start writing down a theory on a manifold that is a four dimensional differentiable manifold. Uh, unless that's all we mean, and if we want to go to a more physical understanding of dimensionality, then the very moment you quantize uh, geometry, you should expect uh, dimensionality to be also subject to fluctuations and to a number of quantum uh, effects okay. as a possibility. Yeah. Okay, and uh, the same is in okay. fact for topology. We normally start uh, in the simplest uh, formalism, in the simplest uh, um, uh, context. Uh, uh, we start uh, by you know, fixing the topology of space time and then just studying and quantizing fields moving on a given topology. But uh, as it could also be the case that the topology itself uh, fluctuates. Okay. Yeah. Is there another question? Yes. Um, Can you speak a little bit loudly? Yeah, I can't hear much. All right, I'm try. I'll try to speak louder. Um, yeah, what are the implications on time? I mean, could time, because of quantum fluctuations, suddenly run slower, or faster, or even backward? Uh, in principle, yes. The point is uh, then has to be asked in specific frameworks. Uh, they can be more or less rigid about uh, what you are quantizing and uh, what you allow your quantum states to to have to do. Uh, in principle, yes. I mean, when I say that uh, you know there is a certain causal structure which implies a certain uh, distinction between the past and future, at mm -hmm. least locally. Um, that I'm making a statement about the geometry. Mm. And therefore, the moment I uh, subject geometry to fluctuations, I'm subjecting uh, causality uh, to fluctuations. And even time ordering in principle can be subject to fluctuations. But again, it's not uh, this is not that every theory of quantum gravity will do it uh, or that uh, the fluctuations will take some specific form. I'm just saying that this is something you could expect, and then you have to investigate in uh, uh, individual uh, specific frameworks. All right, thank you. You, I mean, you can, in some approaches, you actually uh, take a, a more, uh, um, you can say conservative, but not in any negative sense, uh, perspective, and you say, well, no, I want to limit which aspect of space-time is actually subject to fluctuations and you may work with some uh, fundamental uh, uh, causal ordering, for example. It's a choice, 
and then uh, you have to see uh, how, how far you can go with the formalism and then uh, whether nature agrees with your assumptions. I hope that uh, helps. Okay, so I, I move forward. Yeah, please. Yeah, so the moment, uh, so another implication is that the moment geometric quantities uh, fluctuates, uh, the, the notion of uh, any um, uh, space time notion, for example, the notion of event, uh, has no sharp uh, meaning and it will be itself subject to fluctuations and be the result of probabilistic uh, uh, measurements and observations. Causality, as I already mentioned, and this is the issue of uh, uh, quantum causality or fluctuating causal structures is already an, an important research directions in the foundations of quantum mechanics, not, not directly uh, studied in the context of quantum gravity. Uh, and you may ask whether geometric quantities on top of fluctuating will acquire a discrete spectrum, which is true in some uh, quantum gravity approaches, whether you are going to find some minimal length possible, or minimal volume. And if that's the case, because we know that in quantum mechanics, a lot of uh, uh, classically continuous uh, quantities become discretized, acquire a discrete spectrum. And you know, if you do it with the energy, it was already quite uh, radical and revolutionary in the last century, the beginning of last century with the birth of quantum mechanics. Now try imagining it for uh, geometric quantities like a volume or a length. What is left, uh, that's the question of the continuum intuition we, we use uh, about uh, space and time. And this is another illustrative picture, not the result of, a, of an experiment, uh, about uh, quantum uh, fluctuating uh, space-time. Now, normally we, we want to associate uh, all these fluctuations, these quantum properties of uh, space-time to uh, a scale that we call the Planck scale. We want to say, well, this stuff is confined or is expected at the Planck scale, at a certain distance, at a certain uh, um, scale of energy. So let me spend a few words about that because, in fact, is a, is a ubiquitous, uh, ubiquitous notion in the, in quantum gravity in the quantum gravity literature. Well, the notion of a Planck scale, in case you were you were wondering and you didn't know before, it's uh, simply what comes out of combining uh, fundamental constants of current physics, the Newton's constant for gravitational physics, appearing also in GR as the coupling constant of the gravitational field with matter the Planck constant uh, uh, signaling uh, the uh, presence of quantum effects and the velocity of light that tells you that you are in a relativistic rather than non-relativistic uh, context. All of them are expected to play a role in quantum gravity because you want a theory which is uh, about gravity, quantum and relativistic. So if you combine them, you get a notion of uh, a scale of length, which is uh, 10 to the minus uh, 33 centimeters. And uh, just let me just focus on that first. So I want you to appreciate uh, not only that it's small, but how small it is. And as a result, uh, how arrogant we are as quantum gravity physicists to ask questions about it. Um, despite all our good motivations. And the point is simply that uh, uh, you should realize that uh, the, set the distance in scales between uh, the Planck scale, where quantum gravity is supposed to um, uh, replace our current theories uh, for, for good, and uh, uh, the scale of the smallest, uh, the smallest distance scale we actually probe with experiments uh, and we describe with the standard model, say the core scale, is about 17 uh, 10 orders of magnitude or 16 now i don't remember the exact number but that's roughly the same uh, separation in scales so in orders of magnitude between uh, the core scale again the minimal one uh, the smallest one we actually tested and uh, we have some understanding about uh, observationally and uh, uh, our scale now uh, uh, let's take my scale to be precise of the order of a meter. Um, not very tall, but that's, uh, the, as an order of magnitude, it works uh, fine for everyone. And uh, so it's the same uh, distance, so uh, more or less uh, 15, 18 orders of magnitude 
than uh, between the quarks and the Planck scale. So we, we want to, we know how much physics uh, and uh, interesting physics and new phenomena uh, uh, take place uh, between uh, the, uh, you know, our macroscopic uh, human scale and the core scale. Now we want to make a similar jump in one stroke. So having uh, used this as a cautionary remark, uh, uh, for any quest uh, for quantum gravity. Let me add uh, one more point. All this talking about uh, the relevant scale being the Planck scale, being a certain number and, uh, you know, and so on, is based on current physics, which is great, it works very well, but it's obviously tested up to very different scales than the one we're talking about. Moreover, it is based on concepts that uh, may, not, may well not be valid uh, for long, in a sense, for uh, much beyond the scales where we probe. And in fact, uh, all the motivations uh, we have seen for it here at quantum gravity suggest that at least one, if not uh, many more than one, of the fundamental uh, concepts that we, uh, on which we base our uh, field theory, local uh, physics description of uh, the world, uh, will break down. So take also the notion of a plant scale as the relevant one with some uh, caution. Okay, so this was the other main message, and I move forward. So if we and so all of that uh, so far was based on the idea that uh, well we just need to quantize uh, general relativity in one way or another, but I already hinted that, that maybe a more radical perspective is needed for quantum gravity. Maybe what we need to do is not quantize in GR as such, but we just have to, we have to understand some. Uh, totally different type of degrees of freedom and have space and time NGR emerge out of that, out of them as an approximate effective description. And the gravitational field would result in this picture, in this perspective from a collective dynamics of the non-space-time degrees of freedom, non-spatio-temporal degrees of freedom. So the questions that the theory of quantum gravity should really pose is, first of all, what are the candidate atoms or microscopic building blocks out of which we recover continuum space-time and GR in some limit? So you should realize that this problem becomes very similar to the typical one in condensed matter. There, you know, we know what the fundamental degrees of freedom are. We know that uh, the condensed matter system in our lab is made out of uh, atoms. We know what the theory of everything for those atoms uh, is. It's uh, some complicated uh, quantum many body Schrodinger equation. And the task uh, is not so much uh, to, to study the atoms uh, uh, individually or to characterize them. I mean, once you have understood what they are, you should still uh, uh, tackle the more difficult problem of extracting uh, interesting macroscopic physics and understanding uh, all the uh, rich, uh, effective physics of the condensed matter system. So all the different phases, including exotic uh, quantum phases uh, and uh, all the uh, macroscopic behavior. So in, in this perspective of quantum gravity, this, something similar to this is what we have to do, what any quantum uh, gravity formalism should do, even after it has identified some good candidate for the fundamental degrees of freedom. And some more pictures just to have a, a break. So just like uh, you have uh, molecules or atoms that uh, you know, collectively interact to form uh, some macroscopic uh, fluid, well, maybe something similar should happen with uh, quantum gravity. You have some fundamental macroscopic, uh, quant microscopic uh, quantum entities. Uh, and of course, the picture is uh, purely indicative. Uh, and uh, they collectively interact to form an approximately continuum, maybe still quantum and fluctuating notion of space-time, where some version of quantized GR may apply and then leading to a more classical, smooth uh, uh, picture of space-time, as we know in classical GR. Okay, that's it for the motivation. I want to now briefly survey a number of uh, uh, approaches to quantum gravity. May I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I, 
I think one of the goal is also to discover um, new implications on things that we haven't known. Would you agree? Okay, so of course, are there? So, so we have discussed that there are several things that their cur current theories cannot um, mm -hmm. tell us. But are there some questions or some experiments that we can do yeah. now? Uh, whose bear with me for, with, uh, with bear with me five more minutes, and after this uh, brief survey of uh, approaches, I will have a section on quantum gravity phenomenology. Oh, okay. That's right. Thank you. Possible quantum gravity phenomenology. Uh, as I tried to emphasize before, I may put forward conceptual motivation, but we are physicists and we have uh, physical questions in mind when we ask for, uh, when we try to construct a better theory than the ones we have. So uh, let me first briefly mention a number of historic uh, approaches. So the standard uh, um, uh, strategies uh, adopted in the first, uh, let's say, 50 years of uh, quantum gravity research were really the straightforward, uh, based on the straightforward idea of uh, taking the classical theory, general relativity, and quantize it. Different approaches were, different formulas were, were studied because they are different quantization techniques. So uh, you can first of all try to study, uh, to quantize the gravitational field using perturbative uh, quantum field theory. You, you can start with the, um, the geometry of space-time, assume that uh, what is mostly subject to uh, quantum properties are fluctuations over a given metric, say the flat one. And uh, this flat metric will, will uh, allow you to use some uh, no, uh, clear notion of the causal structure and uh, space and time directions. And you only quantize the fluctuations. This uh, produces the notion of a graviton, so some massless uh, spin two quantum of the perturbative gravitational field, but it's still like a field moving on a given background space time. This is a long tradition. It's, uh, it's great. We learned a lot of things, but we also learned that it cannot be a fundamental quantum theory of gravity because it's not uh, normalizable. So it simply breaks down and we don't know how to complete it when the energies become sufficiently high. And in a sense, it's not so surprising because uh, you know, that's exactly when you expect uh, that any quantum field, including the perturbative gravitational field, will start uh, back reacting in a, in a substantial manner, in a non-negligible manner on any background you assume to have. So, uh, Daniele? Yeah. Uh, so, it's a basically perturbation theory of H mu nu. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, like uh, like us in usual quantum mechanics, we usually say that if there is a parameter which is very less than one, then you can actually uh, uh, use the prescription of perturbation theory. So here, what's the parameter around which you are taking that perturbation? So, um... I think it depends on the formulation, but uh, you, you you can just uh, uh, simply expand in uh, curvature invariance. Okay. And if you're expanding around the flat space, you know any curvature invariant would be zero. Uh -huh. And then you assume that you are confined to uh, a regime of the uh, uh, fluctuating field where any curvature invariant is small. Okay. And whenever it starts becoming too big uh, above a certain threshold, that of course is a bit uh, conventional, mm -hmm. uh, then you are not sure you should trust the theory. In practice, what you should do is to try to study the back reaction in, in a semi-classical approximation on the flat metric mm -hmm. and check if it is comparable to the effect you are actually trying to measure. Okay. Uh, I think that would be the most physical way of doing it. Uh, maybe you can try to do it in a more, uh, you know, formal manner by introducing a parameter, but that should be the physical meaning. Okay, okay. thank you. You're welcome. So uh, another strategy for quantizing a classical theory is through canonical quantization. So you may separate, you may split uh, space-time in, in, uh, according to some foliation, mm 
and then uh, uh, induce uh, phase space variables uh, on, on the foliation, on any slice of the foliation. Then you have a, a canonical system, a phase space description of the physical system. For in the case of uh, gravity, you're going to have uh, as uh, phase space variables uh, in the standard metric uh, formulation of general relativity, you're going to have a spatial uh, tree metric described the intrinsic geometry on the slice. And then you're going to have the extrinsic curvature, basically, uh, encoding how the slice, uh, the foliation is embedded in the, in the four dimensional picture as the corresponding conjugate variable. The point is that uh, the theory does not allow for a preferred foliation. So in fact, uh, the whole dynamics of the theory at the classical level will be encoded in a number of constraints that have this meaning. So they will tell you that, uh, yes, you can formulate everything with respect to a foliation, but uh, you should not have any preferred status for such a foliation because it would give uh, effectively some preferred notion of time and space. And so the content of the theory becomes uh, encoded in a number of constraints, uh, which are basically uh, uh, encoding the diffeomorphism invariance, the symmetry of classical general relativity. And the interesting point is that uh, uh, this is all there is to the dynamics. There's no separate Hamiltonian that you could use to describe temporal evolution. And in a sense, it's not strange because if there's no preferred temporal direction, there shouldn't be any preferred Hamiltonian evolving in a preferred temporal direction. And the same is at the quantum level. You can quantize, at least formally, the classical system. You are going to have wave functions of uh, the intrinsic metric, for example and they will be subject to constraints. So instead of having a, a Schrodinger equation for the wave function of geometry of space, you're going to have a constraint equation with no temporal variable appearing on the left or right hand side of the equation. So this is one way of stating in a rather naive way the so-called problem of time quantum gravity. There seems to be no time. Where by that we mean no preferred temporal direction. And in a sense, it's already there in the classical theory. Uh, also, this approach uh, doesn't really go beyond the, the, formal, uh, form, uh, the formal treatment. It's very hard to make, it, make sense of it uh, at the mathematical level beyond the semi-classical approximations. So it, it's not, uh, I would say, uh, uh, one of the uh, currently promising uh, quantum theories of gravity or approaches to quantum gravity in a, in a strong sense. But of course, also from this, we have learned a, number, uh, a large number of things. And the same is for the last uh, broad class of uh, uh, historical uh, approaches, which is the path integral one, in which uh, you know, we know we can quantize a classical... Can you yeah. one more question, please? So uh, in the previous slide, once you have mentioned that this, uh, uh, can you go to the pre previous slide please? Yeah. So uh, like you, you were talking about two constraints and this uh, mm -hmm. like acting on something, uh, is this the wave function of the universe? So the, so if you want to call the wave function uh, of uh, geometries, uh, the wave function of the universe, then you can call it like that. And uh, uh, because it can call, it's supposed to be a function over all the geometric degrees of freedom over all of space. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, yes. But here I'm not adopting any cosmological restriction in the sense of dealing with the homogeneous uh, geometries, for example. Uh -huh. This is really the, it's supposed to be the full theory. Okay, okay, okay. And then what we have there is the so-called wheeler de Witt equation yeah. for the full wave function of uh, geometric degrees of freedom. Yeah, true. Okay. Yeah, so I, I was a bit confused because you have only written in terms of H -Y, H -I -J. So in cosmological mm -hmm. case, you may write in terms of scalar perturbations as well. Now, of course, I mean, then you can decide uh, in what the parameterization or what uh, variables you write to the metric. Yeah, true. So then, uh, you know, especially if it is homogeneous, then it's super convenient to write in terms of scale factors. True. true. But uh, I mean, this is not, I mean, I'm only really illustrating the very general point. You have some wave function over your geometric degrees of freedom in space on the slice, okay. whatever they are. 
and, and then you have a constraint equation for it, which is the wheeler devitt equation. Then if you're restricting to any particular sector of the full theory, then uh, so be it. Okay, so the same is true at the um, covariant level. Another strategy for quantizing a classical theory is through path integral methods. So you can try to write down uh, first formally and then you try to make mathematical sense of it. A sum over all space-time geometries, for example, interpolating between initial and final uh, spatial geometries as boundary data. And you can weight uh, the sum by the exponential of your preferred classical action, uh, say the einstein Hilbert action for GR. This would define, uh, could be used as a definition, as a formal definition of a quantum theory, if you could compute it for any choice of boundary data, so boundary states. Uh, also in this case, uh, uh, we learned a lot of things about what quantum theory should do or could do in, in this language, but uh, it's again too ill-defined the mathematical level to be regarded as a fully solid approach beyond the semi-classical analysis or some formal type of uh, insight. Okay, as so this was the just the historical ones, not the current ones, and. Uh, um, as I said, we've learned a lot of things, that uh, uh, some of which I, I learned here, but we're still lacking a, a more promising, a more uh, potentially uh, solid uh, uh, for formulation of quantum gravity at the mathematical level. So let me switch uh, now to uh, some of the current, uh, a very brief overview of some current uh, approaches to quantum gravity, the way I see them. And uh, um, I'll be fast and I'll probably not do a very good uh, service to any of them. So first of all, one main message is that uh, there are many approaches to quantum gravity with a number of uh, mutual uh, relations. And again, the picture here is purely indicative. It's not uh, a faithful representation of the quantum gravity landscape. But I would like you to bring home the message that there are many approaches. And we should keep an open mind about which one of them is more promising or less. Of course, there are different stages of development. Uh, you could uh, you know, value some particular partial result in one of them more than others, so to regarding it more promising than others. But that's, you know, until we have nature telling us uh, by means of experiments and observations uh, that one is uh, definitely better than the others, we should keep an open mind. So, um, well, there's, as a result, there are also very many sub-communities, and uh, this is a typical picture of a, of a quantum gravity conference. You see, uh, you know, quantum gravity theorists discussing in different groups, uh, depending on the, their subfield of interest, uh, physical or formal. Um, and uh, uh, everything is very uh, polite and uh, uh, objective. Uh, except that sometimes, of course, relations uh, can be also difficult. And this is another picture of a different uh, part of the quantum gravity conference, which may be more uh, um, realistic uh, of what actually happens uh, during a conference. In any case, let me brief overview a number of approaches. Of course, you all know, at least in, in, uh, in name, about string theory. Uh, it starts uh, uh, with uh, as a quantum theory of strings. Uh, so in a sense, it's a drastic generalization of the perturbative approach to quantum gravity, which we have some uh, quantum excitation, now not just a perturbative uh, gravitational field, but uh, strings uh, moving on a given background. And uh, the amazing thing is that it can be shown the strings uh, contain, uh, in a very precise sense, uh, not only the graviton, but particles of any spin and mass. So it, it has the potential of being unified theory of gravity and other interactions. Uh, it's also amazing that as a matter of consistency with the requirement of conformal symmetry of the, the string uh, theory, uh, you can uh, uh, show that the background space-time has to satisfy the uh, generativistic equations with the quantum modifications. Uh, and the I would say that from the point of view of quantum gravity, the uh, key results uh, are not so much this picture of uh, strings uh, moving on a, on a given background, which we know can only be an approximation, but uh, it's clear the space-time uh, is going to be very, very different from the usual one, uh, 
in uh, quantum field theory if the effective excitations are strings. It may have uh, you know, uh, uh, different topologies and geometry. In fact, the topology and geometry may not be, uh, are not going to be fundamental. There may be a distance is smaller than some minimal uh, length, the string length that cannot be probed in any uh, strong sense. And, uh, and then we've learned uh, through the you know, last uh, 30 years or so of uh, string theory that uh, there are many you non know, perturbative aspects uh, that, uh, uh, and the theory is much, much richer than just the theory of strings. Then we've learned uh, that uh, different effective uh, string theories uh, could be, are related to one another, suggesting that it could be uh, a, a more fundamental uh, unified description of all of them. Then uh, within string theory, we first uh, uh, started understanding about uh, the ADS CFT correspondence, which is a very intriguing uh, uh, relation. Depending on your point of view, it's a strict duality or just a correspondence, uh, maybe approximate, between uh, you know, um, a theory in a, a d-dimensional space-time with uh, uh, that includes gravity as a dynamical field. Uh, and with the uh, uh, ADS boundary conditions, so asymptotically your geometry should be ADS in the initial formulation at least, uh, and it's in direct correspondence with the conformal field theory on the boundary of that uh, uh, d-dimensional space-time. So this may suggest that the world is indeed holographic, so that uh, uh, in fact uh, you can fully encode uh, uh, tiers in d-dimensions uh, in uh, tiers in descriptions of, which are effect, uh, in effect uh, uh, d minus one dimensional. Uh, it suggests that uh, as a possibility that uh, gravitational theories and gauge theories uh, could be equivalent in some form because they usually the conformal field theory that is used uh, is uh, a gauge theory. And uh, uh, in fact, that this ADS-CFT correspondence seems to be uh, not only very exciting, but very general, and probably not so much about strings per se, but much more uh, fundamental and more general than even string theory. In any case, about string theory, you can just say that there have been uh, such a large number of mathematical results and is such a you know, rich generalization of quantum field theory that uh, at the very least uh, is, uh, you know, a, how to say, uh, a place to look for a number of uh, insights and uh, uh, mathematical tools. Another way to try to make sense and generalize uh, the uh, effective field theory description of gravity that was shown not to be fundamental in the perturbative setting is simply to go non-perturbative. And this is the idea of the asymptotic safety scenario. You can try to show that uh, a quantum field theory of gravity uh, can be fundamental. In fact, you, you could try to show, and in fact, there are nice results that, sh that uh, seem to prove that uh, this is not a far-fetched uh, hypothesis, that uh, the theory could have a UV fixed point, uh, uh, so it's well-defined as a fundamental theory, at least in principle, simply this UV fixed point is not to be Gaussian. So the theory is not, uh, cannot be described perturbatively at high energies. So I'm skipping it through a number of things, of course, in all these approaches. One way to try to make sense of the path integral for quantum gravity is to go discrete, replace uh, the space-time manifold with a lattice, replace the Einstein-Hilbert action with some uh, discretized version on a given lattice of the theory, and then write down the path integral in which uh, the um, dynamical degrees of freedom that encode the geometry could be in the first instance uh, the length of the edges of the lattice that would be the direct counterpart of the metric but uh, and that would give rise to what is called as uh, uh, what is called the quantum verge calculus another possibility is that you in fact uh, uh, compute uh, geometric quantities just checking uh, the combinatorics of the lattice uh, in two dimensions, you know that if you take uh, equilateral triangles, uh, well, if you fit six of them around the point exactly, then you are dealing with flat space. And if you're fitting more or less than six of such equilateral triangles, then you're dealing with uh, positive or negative curvature. So you can encode the curvature and uh, therefore geometry just in uh, you know, the combinatorial structure of your lattices, and you make that dynamical 
and that's the approach called dynamical triangulations, by summing over all possible triangulations, uh, maybe with some topological restriction. So these are another, the main idea of another two approaches to quantum gravity. The other approach that you may have heard about uh, in parallel with, the, with string theory in later years is loop quantum gravity, which started from uh, uh, just the attempt to canonically quantize GR uh, simply in a different set of variables in which you, so you first formulate GR as if it was a very peculiar because diffeomorphism invariant uh, gauge theory, and then you canonically quantize. Now, I won't go through any of these quantization uh, steps, uh, but I want to tell you uh, two words about the endpoint. Because the starting point is clearly quite conservative. You take the theory, you write down in a slightly different variables at the classical level, and you canonically quantize. Nothing more, nothing less. Well, the result uh, of this procedure, for what we know at the moment, is that uh, the quantum states of the gravitational field, the quantum states of space, are actually described by purely combinatorial and algebraic uh, entities, so-called spin networks. So they're basically graphs, networks, to which you assign labels, which are representations of uh, uh, the local gauge group of gravity, the Lorentz group, or SU2 if you take uh, a particular gauge. And further results uh, is that uh, not only your states of space, your quantum states of space, uh, are uh, purely combinatorial and algebraic instead of continuum and geometric, but uh, geometric operators can be quantized uh, and they acquire indeed a dis discrete spectrum. So even though you start in a very conservative manner, you end up with a radically uh, different picture of uh, space, uh, uh, quantum space and geometry than uh, the one we, we started from and we're used to. At the covariant level, the so-called spin foam version of loop quantum gravity, you find something very similar. You find that you can write down the counterpart uh, uh, in this language of a sum over geometries but there's going to be a sum over purely combinatorial and algebraic uh, uh, structures, one dimension higher than graphs, so-called two complexes. So again, we have a lot of, there are a lot of results um, at the mathematical and some uh, physically inspiring uh, models. Uh, so uh, this is indeed one of the modern approaches to quantum gravity that is most uh, studied. I just want to emphasize uh, what radically different picture we end up with uh, for space-time. Um, and then tensorial group field theories uh, is uh, uh, another formalism which is particularly dear to my heart, so to speak, it's, it's one of the things I work on, uh, and it takes uh, the same suggestion of a uh, purely discrete uh, combinatorial and algebraic uh, uh, picture of uh, the fundamental entities uh, at, at its core, and it can be understood as uh, a quantum field theory not defined on space-time, but on some auxiliary group manifold, whose basic quanta are indeed uh, the same uh, uh, building blocks uh, of uh, the quantum states of uh, loop quantum gravity, but also the same building blocks uh, of the uh, lattices that are used in uh, simplicial gravity uh, path integrals, like uh, quantum regex calculus or dynamical triangulations. Okay, and in fact, uh, you find the directly a relation with such uh, other approaches to quantum gravity. When you take the theory, you expand it in Feynman diagrams, and you find out uh, that the Feynman diagrams uh, of the fundamental entities uh, of group field theories are in fact lattices, like the ones used in uh, lattice quantum gravity and uh, uh, covariant loop quantum gravity, weighted by amplitudes which match again in. Uh, appropriate models, the ones that are used in, uh, in the spin form context or in lattice gravity uh, uh, formalisms. Okay, I, so in a sense you find within this uh, tensorial group field theory formalism the ingredients and the structures of other approaches too, for which I think it would be, yeah. What is the vacuum state here? The action yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the specific action is a specific choice of model within the framework. The yeah. framework here is a, that of a field theory for fields uh, defined on a group manifold, which is not uh, understood as uh, directly to having to do with space-time, some auxiliary manifold mm -hmm. out of which you take your data. Mm 
a discrete uh, space time emerges at this uh, perturbative level as a lattice. Mm -hmm. And then a continuum space time is what should emerge from uh, a continuum limit of such uh, uh, field theory okay. or such lattice description. So uh, I, I can give you, of course, a specific action, uh, but uh, that would specify a model, not uh, not the general framework, which is, would be, I can do it later if you want. Okay. okay, and there are a number of approaches that I, I don't even discuss in any, in any one minute, okay? So the landscape is even richer than what uh, uh, may seem already at this point. So, from this very brief overview of, uh, of approaches, it should be clear that uh, indeed uh, the various hints uh, about the fundamental disappearance of continuum space time uh, and its emergent nature uh, are actually supported, as I had anticipated, by contemporary quantum gravity formalism themselves. They seem to identify candidate fundamental degrees of freedom, which are in fact uh, not spatial temporal in the usual way. Now, I want to discuss two points and then, uh, yeah, and then I'll, I'll go and close. So, suppose that indeed you take on board the idea that space time is emergent. Now, you can, and geometry as well. So, you can come from string theory, you can come from blue quantum gravity, you name it. What will it emerge from? What would be the feature, the properties of the underlying system, of the underlying uh, degrees of freedom? That uh, you will that will allow geometry, notional geometry, to uh, to be used uh, at the macroscopic level. Well, one suggestion is that uh, uh, this notion, this uh, basic feature of microscopic degrees of freedom, will be entanglement. So there are a number of results uh, that put in direct correspondence uh, geometric quantities, distances, areas, and so on, with the entanglement between constituents of systems which are in fact themselves not gravitational. So this, the suggestion is uh, in a slogan that the world is made of entanglement. To, to, and again, I'm not going to discuss in any detail any such uh, result, uh, but uh, uh, there is the idea that uh, uh, the, what is called neutral information, which is a measure of entanglement between two regions, uh, is also a way of uh, um, uh, determining if uh, the two regions are in fact connected as two regions of the same space-time or not. And uh, um, there is a generalization of the uh, relation uh, between uh, entropy and area of the surface, which uh, has to do with the, uh, the entanglement entropy of uh, more general conformal field theories. Therefore, we see that uh, the entanglement entropy of a theory, which a priori has not much to do with gravity, nor with the non trivial geometry, is uh, reinterpreted as uh, a geometric quantity. And in other quantum gravity approaches, like the ones I mentioned that uh, posit uh, or uh, find uh, some sort of uh, discrete uh, combinatorial structure at the, at the foundations of uh, space-time, you can actually show that uh, the connectivity of the, of the degrees of freedom uh, that uh, uh, constitute such uh, quantum entities is in fact uh, uh, their entanglement. And there are a number of results uh, uh, on entanglement in this type of uh, uh, discrete quantum gravity approaches. Second, and last about this general point about emergence of uh, space-time and geometry, you can ask, uh, okay, how should I go about uh, trying to extract uh, uh, an effective continuum description, maybe uh, an effective cosmological dynamics uh, in a relativistic language uh, uh, as a corner of uh, general relativity from uh, uh, a more fundamental quantum theory of gravity based on these uh, non spatial temporal entities. Well, cosmology can be seen, of course, as we hinted already before, as simply a sector, the homogeneous sector of general relativity. So you would truncate the degrees of freedom of the classical gravitational field. And if you want to go to, quantum, to a quantum version of the theory, you would quantize that. that is, this is what corresponds to so-called quantum cosmology, in which you symmetry reduce uh, to homogeneous uh, degrees of freedom at the classical level, and then you quantize. There are a lot of interesting results, 
for example, there are strong suggestions that uh, uh, there, could, there could be a sort of a bounce uh, replacing the Big Bang uh, singularity. Uh, but this is not uh, how cosmology is best uh, seen, most naturally seen, if you adopt uh, an emergent uh, space-time perspective. You would say that from that perspective that uh, cosmology should be the result of cosgraining the fundamental gravitational degrees of freedom up to global quantities only. And uh, so cosmology should be the regime of the theory in which uh, you, know, you have a fundamental quantum uh, degrees of freedom. Then uh, uh, you look, you try to rephrase the, the whole theory in terms of a few macroscopic observables of global nature like the total scale factor, the, uh, the, the total volume, uh, and things like this, you are supposed to be close to equilibrium. Otherwise, you don't expect that this uh, drastic uh, cost graining uh, is, is a good description of physics. And uh, because you're adopting such a cost grained uh, uh, language, you should hope, uh, if not expect, uh, some uh, form of uh, uh, being insensitive to the details of the microstructure. Well, these are basically the defining uh, points of uh, an hydrodynamic regime. So the conjecture would be that uh, continuum gravitational physics, and in particular cosmology, should be looked for in a highly coarse-grained uh, hydrodynamic regime of fundamental quantum gravity. Okay, and now I come to the last part of the, of the not-so-technical Part. And then I think I will I will tell you more about group field theory and uh, some recent results only if uh, there is time or you ask. Otherwise, I just close and, 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 and that's it. So let me discuss phenomenology. As I said, we, we, we want quantum theory of gravity to be a, a physical theory. We want to test it. We want to have something new to say about observable phenomena in our universe. Now, there is a vast... Uh, literature by now, since, the la since again 20 years on quantum gravity phenomenology. So quantum gravity is a, a research area which has to do with uh, uh, experiments, observations, and indeed the phenomenology. The, this phenomenology uh, uh, served already a number of useful uh, um, goals. First of all, it clarified what are the physical contexts in which uh, some quantum gravity effects could be relevant. It helped uh, to characterize in a preliminary manner uh, such effects. And in fact, it also helped uh, to rule out some of them already. Uh, so quantum gravity phenomenology includes uh, a number of uh, sub-directions. So there are uh, phenomenological models uh, uh, that are purpose-built. So they're meant to be just phenomenological in which you simply try to write down a simple model of uh, some relevant uh, physical uh, regime or phenomenon which incorporates ideas coming from fundamental approaches. Um, and uh, or there can be models of extreme physical systems like uh, the Big Bang or, or quantum black holes uh, inspired by specific quantum gravity approaches. So you, you can speak, for example, of the string cosmology or loop quantum gravity, black holes, uh, and so on, where you have a more direct relation, but still at this uh, uh, toy model phenomenological level with the uh, quantum gravity approaches. And sometimes there are altogether new quantum gravity ideas implemented in toy models, and they're actually waiting for a realization in a full quantum gravity formalisms. So let me discuss a few of them. So a lot of, of the literature has to do with the general scenarios in which some key element of usual space-time physics are modified. Uh, one is scenarios which implement uh, some form of minimal length. Others are scenarios in which uh, the uncertainty relations are so modified. This GUP type of thing. So, sorry, test again. Generalized uncertainty principle kind of. Yeah, you, you deform the usual uncertainty principle. You can show that the moment you do that, you're basically introducing a new scale which has to be related to the Planck scale, either energy or length. And uh, so you expect this type of modification to be possibly a result at the effective level of, uh, uh, of some underlying quantum theory of gravity. 
And the same is true for uh, violations or deformations of space-time symmetries. As I said, this is like uh, you take uh, local effective space-time physics as we know it, you pick up some of the ingredients, uh, you modify them, and you, in most cases, uh, the modification is going to be weighted uh, by some uh, plan scale uh, uh, parameter like a length or an energy or a mass and so on. And you try to see, uh, uh, to, uh, you try to answer the question, if this is the sort of modification coming from a, from a fundamental theory of gravity, what are the observable effects? That's the spirit. And in particular, these things, uh, these uh, uh, scenarios, uh, minimal length, uh, deform uncertainty relations, uh, violations or deformations of space and symmetries, typically produce, uh, for example, modified dispersion relations for uh, particles or fields. They, they produce modified uh, scattering thresholds for a number of uh, high energy phenomena, like cosmic rays and so on. And sometimes they, they can be implemented uh, or uh, in the form of uh, non-local terms, uh, so as a violation of locality in, uh, in uh, field theory. So this is a set of result interactions. Of course, there is the whole uh, uh, attempt, set of attempts to describe uh, the Hawking radiation uh, uh, in a way that includes uh, some more fundamental uh, quantum gravity physics. This could bring uh, uh, deviations, sorry, not deviations, which are to show it's deviations from, thermal, from the thermal spectrum. And those could have, in principle, uh, um, observational consequences. The whole uh, idea that there is some remnant, for example, uh, to the uh, Hawking evaporation process for black holes uh, will involve uh, ultimately quantum gravity, and there are quantum gravity models uh, of uh, black holes uh, evaporate, black hole evaporation uh, that uh, uh, are used uh, to extract also phenomenological implications. And in general, any resolution of the information paradox uh, that aims for some testable effect uh, involves assumptions or some effective modeling of quantum gravity effects. Uh, any description of black holes uh, which somehow substitutes uh, the uh, cosmological singularity with uh, some quantum region, uh, so producing uh, some effectively regular black hole spacetime, is in fact uh, a model of quantum gravity phenomenology because it relies on some assumptions about uh, what happens in that uh, quantum gravity region close to the singularity. And uh, uh, a lot of uh, um, proposals have been put forward for exotic uh, compact objects that uh, could be distinguished from uh, uh, black holes as described by general relativity uh, in the context of gravitational waves observations, for example. Well, if these exotic compact objects exist, and in, where we normally would expect black holes, uh, then uh, it is likely that uh, uh, there is some modification of, of general relativity, uh, possibly involving quantum gravity that uh, will uh, produce them, that will account for their formation. And then in cosmology, to, to close this more uh, uh, overview of possible uh, uh, physical regimes where we, uh, we, we could have uh, implications of quantum gravity, as I said, the, uh, the uh, existing cosmological scenarios uh, to a different uh, level, in a different, to a different extent, uh, rely on uh, uh, assumptions about the quantum gravity regime close to the singularity. So inflation, which uh, you know, you, uh, I don't go through what inflation is, but the accelerated expansion right after the Big Bang, producing uh, uh, a scale invariant spectrum for the um, for the uh, cosmological perturbations uh, that, that we see, but leaves a number of questions unanswered. Now, depending on the scale of inflation, you may or may not need uh, quantum gravity to answer them, but in any case, uh, quantum gravity could provide a completion of any inflationary scenario. Uh, explaining, for example, if uh, what produces the, the, the inflation itself. It could be that, uh, you know, you don't need to add a new type of matter fields, but these are just an effective description of purely quantum gravity effects. Um, 
if you uh, you, you involve uh, transplantation modes uh, uh, and depending on the scenario and your interpretation you could have to invoke uh, uh, quantum gravity to describe them and in general the inflationary space time uh, still contains uh, a singularity and the moment you try to solve that uh, by quantum gravity effects uh, it's hard to screen uh, um, uh, effects at the later stage uh, after the singularity uh, from uh, uh, what you modified uh, in, uh, uh, in quantum gravity using quantum gravity of the classical singularity but inflation the need of uh, uh, quantum gravity from the point of inflation is uh, more controversial because it may depend on the specific model of inflation you are considering but uh, in other scenarios like bouncing cosmologies is uh, rather clear that you're making assumptions about uh, uh, a replacement of uh, the Big Bang singularity by a bounce and that new physics is needed uh, to really substantiate uh, this assumption. Uh, so in this sense... Uh, for this Big Bang, uh, sorry, bouncing cosmology, I can understand that it removes the Big Bang singularity, but what mm -hmm. about the pre-Big Bang theory? Yeah, so what I'm, what I'm saying is that uh, if you want to write down a fully consistent uh, and supposedly fundamental description of a bouncing cosmology, mm -hmm. that will need to include uh, the quantum gravity effects uh, removing uh, the singularity. Okay. Then uh, the pre-Big Bang, uh, the pre-bounce yeah, beta uh, universe could well be semi-classical at large volumes. In fact, in many scenarios, that's the case. You start with a semi-classical universe, it contracts, uh, it reaches a quantum phase, mm -hmm. then you need quantum gravity, then you bounce, and then you produce again at late times a semi-classical universe. It doesn't have to be the case that the universe remains uh, described by quantum gravity uh, before the bounce, it, that depends on the scenario. But clearly, in a bouncing scenario, you have to invoke. Uh, you can. You have to complete it by by a quantum gravity uh, theory uh, to justify uh, the replacement of the classical singularity by a bounce. And a scenario like uh, what is called the emergent universe, in which uh, what replaces the Big Bang singularity is some sort of phase transition from a static uh, phase of the universe to an expanding one also requires uh, uh, quantum gravity to describe uh, the phase transition at a more fundamental level. So it certainly requires new physics. In fact, for example, one way to realize it is in the context of uh, string gas cosmology. And something similar could also be true in the context of uh, tensorial group field theories. In fact, even bouncing scenarios have been realized uh, in the context of uh, uh, loop quantum gravity cosmology and uh, in a different, uh, uh, in a slightly different manner in the context of tensorial group field theories. So, I mean, so there are examples of quantum gravity scenarios, quantum gravity formalism, in fact, uh, completing the cosmological uh, scenarios I just mentioned. Okay, and just like for uh, the list of quantum gravity approaches, there is a large list of uh, possible quantum gravity effects uh, in particular in the context of emerging gravity scenarios that they don't go through. Okay, so the main message to bring home is that uh, quantum gravity effects are in fact potentially testable. And we have some experience already of what sort of effects uh, could be uh, produced in a number of phenomenological scenarios. The main challenge, maybe uh, coming from the point of view of the fundamental theory, is that uh, you need still to connect uh, in a solid manner these phenomenological simplified models with the fundamental formalism and without such a strong uh, you know solid uh, link uh, connection if not the full uh, derivation but without a solid connection there would be too much ambiguity in these models uh, to really constrain the fundamental formalism so to really turn them into falsifiable uh, theories okay so i th let me uh, because I've spoken already for uh, for an hour and a half almost. Uh, no, no, you I, 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 I love to listen this part. No, it's okay. So let me first just take a break, uh, for maybe just five minutes, depending on how many questions there are, and yeah. answer questions on the general part. Then uh, I have a, a last uh, 
two parts in which I want to say something more about uh, one particular way of approaching the problem of quantum gravity and some more specific results about uh, the extraction of cosmology out yeah. of it. But uh, uh, let me first uh, take a short uh, break and answer questions. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions? May I ask a, maybe two specific questions? Yeah, ask. So on one slide you said you said that uh, maybe we should break the space-time symmetry by maybe deforming the group, maybe from a classical Lie group to quantum group. Mm -hmm. And on the other slide, I, I think there is also a formalism that tells you um, maybe some some numbers from integrating over classical groups. Uh, is it possible to to merge these two ideas together? Okay, so if the um, for the last the second thing you said, so you when you say that you have to integrate over classical groups and so, were you referring to tensorial group theory? Yes. Or, uh, yes. Ah, yes. okay. Sure. Yeah, you can uh, generalize the formalism uh, in a number of ways uh, to quantum groups. Uh. Yes. That's one way to, to proceed. Another is to, to make the connection. Another is to stay with the classical group, but you can show that uh, some particular effective descriptions around the solutions of uh, a given group field theory model can be described uh, effectively by non commutative field theorists with some quantum group symmetry. Okay. And in fact, uh, uh, in fact, you can also... For another batch process, uh, another round. Uh, it was not planned and uh, we didn't finish all... Um, Sorry? Was that the... Somebody took a question. Ah, it's a phone call. <laughs> all right. Um, and uh, yeah, and this type of quantum group symmetry, in fact, has been found uh, also in, uh, in approaches that are uh, to start with, they're just based on uh, classical groups uh, like uh, loop quantum gravity or group theory or spin form models. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and the effective non commutative field theories for which uh, you know, you do a lot, with which you do a lot of this uh, phenomenology that I mentioned uh, have been derived uh, in a number of ways uh, from this uh, classical looking uh, uh, formalism, classical from the point of view of the type of symmetries you have. So the two things are certainly not incompatible. Then uh, the precise connection will depend once more on the specific formats we are talking about. Mm. In the first approach, you mentioned you also integrate on the quantum group. You can well integrating over a quantum group is maybe a misnomer because uh, you know a quantum group is not a manifold. Yes. Uh, what you can do is to turn to uh, you rewrite the theory in terms of the um, representations of the group. Uh -huh. And then you can switch to the uh, quantum version of that representation space, of that representation oh. theory. Mm -hmm. And nice, in that sir. way, you have a formulation of the theory incorporating the quantum deformation. I see. I see. As I said, that's one strategy, but uh, you know, there are others uh, that have been uh, explored. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I have two questions. Uh, when we speak about connection, in general uh, relativity, a connection uh, uniquely uh, de defined by tensor of energy impulse. But in quantum mechanics, it's a quant quantizing uh, value. Uh, so a connection also is not unique. And when we move object from one point of the space time to another point, uh, it uh, property may change depending know how we make uh, which value of connection we will get. So it's also make probably makes sense. Uh, this one point and another point that uh, definition of geodesic also de depends on connections. So it's uh, no like a change of geometry is uh, you see that, that probably. Uh, so you just pointed out uh, a, a number of the uh, um, ingredients of the usual description of uh, space-time physics, uh, the use of a connection field, uh, first of all, and uh, with certain properties. And uh, second, the very notion of uh, points and geodesics connecting points, which uh, 
are drastically modified uh, even if the only thing you do is to turn uh, the connection field into a quantum one. And of course, the moment you start replacing uh, the, uh, the smooth manifold on which uh, any connection is defined with some uh, more discrete uh, combinatorial structure, then there are further modifications to all these notions. Uh, I, I took it to be a comment rather than a question, and I fully agree. I mean, there are, there are drastic modifications in uh, all these approaches to uh, the way you deal with the connection and what it produces, and, uh, and, uh, and especially to what you do with the manifold. In fact, the loop quantum gravity, which is the one, uh, is maybe a good example, it started by rewriting everything in terms of a, a gravitational connection as the fundamental variable. Then I proceeded by simply, so to speak, uh, so to say, quantizing it, so turning it to, to some operator. And as I emphasized, you end up with uh, uh, states uh, which uh, originally maybe were related to the parallel transports of a continuum connection. But in practice, at the end, they are described uh, as uh, purely combinatorial algebraic structures. So you just deal with the degrees of freedom, which are uh, you know, the combinatorial ones defining a graph and the algebraic ones defining the representations of the Lorentz group to attach to the graph. So I think I take that to be an example of you know how away from the usual picture you go the moment you proceed with quantizing a, a connection field. And second question is related to uh, Lorentz uh, violation uh, because uh, Lorentz uh, symmetry is not just equation how uh, time and length interval change. But this is the question about cho choice of the basis as a fundamental of a physical measurement. Uh, so before we will take, speak about Lord's violation, we should uh, tell what kind of basis we choose in specific physical theory and what kind of uh, transformation should be from one basis to another basis. And only then we can speak if in this theory this transformation is violated or not, because just uh, tell that it's, it's obvious that uh, uh, Lorentz symmetry or special relativity can be held in quantum mechanics, but there will be little different transformations. Sure. Um, so le let me distinguish uh, two, uh, two ways of uh, um, uh, doing violence to, the, to Lorentz symmetry. So one way is indeed the Lorentz violation. Now Lorentz violations uh, in the simplest implementations uh, means uh, that uh, there is some preferred direction in your description of physics. So you have a reduced uh, dimensionality of your symmetry group. So there could be some Einstein iter theory, for example, in which uh, due to some vector field that there is a physically preferred direction in, uh, in space-time. And so the actual symmetry you have uh, is uh, reduced. So you, instead of a 10-dimensional uh, Poincaré symmetry, you have uh, some lower dimensional one, okay? Um, if that's the case, uh, then uh, uh, in practice, you can deal with the whole story in terms of the usual effective field theory. You just need to generalize uh, uh, the, the possible interactions, possible uh, uh, dynamics for your fields. And of course, your classification of fields will have to depend on the reduced uh, symmetry group. But the, the way you use it, the way you implement the idea, doesn't require, in general, too strong uh, departure from uh, usual field theory in the formulation, then the effects uh, are strong. And in fact, some of them are already ruled out. Um, a second way is uh, what, what I call the deformation in the slide. So here you assume that uh, you have big, I mean, one way of doing it is to still assume that you have the Lorentz group uh, or the Poincaré group uh, as a symmetry with these 10 dimensions, but you deform it in an algebraic sense to a quantum group, for example, or something else. That in a sense modifies the way the symmetry acts uh, on fields rather than uh, the, the, the existence of any preferred direction, which in fact is uh, still ruled out. However, you, you're right, the moment you do that, uh, there are a number of uh, 
foundational issues uh, related to your operational definition of uh, uh, points in the manifolds uh, and fields uh, and particles, the way you define momenta, the way you add them, the way you define the rational locality, and so on. And I mean, it would take very far to discuss all these points, but indeed, uh, you're, you're, you're pointing out, out uh, a crucial uh, uh, subsector of the literature trying to deal exactly with these issues which are opened up at the moment you introduce uh, this type of deformations of the symmetry. I hope this helps. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Any more uh, for Daniele? Yeah. Anyone else ask to more question to Daniele, please ask. Otherwise he will switch to the part four. I have a please I have, have a yeah I also have another well it's not another it's it's continuing your answer um, please but I, apparently but it was not uh, exhausted yeah but no 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 but I'm afraid <laughs> I would have been surprised at be... the opposite anyway <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid it's going to be too detailed so if it's no I feel that too, you have yeah? actually approached in a very correct way. Like you start from the basic building block, so it's maybe helpful for a lot of students. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, let, 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 let me see what the question is and then yeah. I will see if it was my fault or <laughs> inevitable. No, no, okay. So in the, in, in the tensorial group field theory that you talked about, mm -hmm. and a, a, after we deform the, the group into quantum groups, an approach is to look at its representation or Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you are talking about quantum groups at root unity, uh, the roots mm -hmm. of unity, where the representations can be semi-simplified to some finite objects. And does that make okay. sense? In the you? models uh, I have in mind, so in the implementations I have in mind, maybe I'm missing some part of the literature, but the, in the case I have in mind, mm -hmm. you take uh, the usual formulation of uh, a group field theory that you like, uh, some particular model, which is you, which is based on, uh, say, the Lorentz group or, or uh, SU two, the rotation group, or you know, something yes. like that. Yes. Uh, uh, normally, you would write this, uh, you know, in a group representation, meaning you have functions on the group. However, mm -hmm. you can do, you know, Peter Weil or Planchard decomposition and rewrite the field, uh, uh, the group field theory field in modes uh, to have mm -hmm. uh, a function of representations of that group. Yes. And then, uh, so in practice, you're just dealing with. Uh, you know, the representation theory of the Lorentz group uh, or the rotation group to define uh, uh, all your uh, theory. Yes. And what people do is, is to take that and replace it with the corresponding uh, definitions and quantities using mm -hmm. uh, some quantum deformation of the initial group. Right. At the representation level. Now, indeed, in most, uh, in the examples I, I can think of, uh, uh, it's always uh, a quantum deformation at the root of unity that is chosen. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure one can raise this uh, fact to a matter of necessity at the mathematical level. Frankly, I don't think so. I think that one could, because I mean, the defining feature of the formalism is not uh, the specific group you use of the represent or the specific representation uh, algebra. Right. So. Um, I don't think that you need the root of unity, just that the, for the models that people have found interesting, uh, uh, mathematically or physically, it's always a root of unity. Uh, especially because works. the root of unity seems to introduce uh, mm -hmm. some notion of uh, a cosmological constant yes. at the level of the discrete gravity that appears in the same uh, uh, models. Yes. But whether this is uh, something more than a fact, uh, uh, <laughs> then I don't know. I see, I see, I see. What about the ultimate answer is some infinite object, like say in the 4D TKFT, uh, a three-dimensional manifold will be assigned to a, a, a vector space, which is effectively uh, an infinite object. I mean, what so you mean defining a so you mean defining a, a group field theory field not on a Lie group uh, which is finite dimensional but some ah. uh, infinite dimensional. What are you talking? What, what are you referring no, no, to? No, no, 
I mean, what if the ultimate theory is tells you that the answer is some infinite thing? While uh, in in the sense of space time, so some infinite dimensional space time. What are you? Uh, is that what you're referring mm. to? I mean, the space of fields uh, is infinite dimensional. The the you know the the the, the Hilbert space uh, of uh, of even an individual tensorial group field theory uh, quantum is infinite dimensional as a Hilbert space. No no no. What is finite Let's dimensional? Suppose we want to measure measure a probability of some of uh -huh. some phenomenon, and what if the the denominator is 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 really infinite. So sometimes you really cannot get the answer. Do we, how would the quant, uh, the group gravity uh, no no the quantum gravity approach deal with mm -hmm. that here? Because it seems so in the quantum group at groups of unity approach, it seems to me that maybe the ultimate answer is there, but only on the very special cases where we can do some very um meaningful measurement uh, but um, I hope it makes sense okay so I'm not sure I understood so the, of course you comp you can compute in the formalism a number of things now uh, you can compute probabilities of uh, uh, some geometric quantity either uh, tentatively at the fundamental level or in some effective uh, semi-classical continuum description mm -hmm. for which we have less experience but we, we can do something now, uh, these calculations involve uh, involve uh, quantities which are defined often on infinite dimensional uh, uh, domains or spaces and so on. Now, uh, the number itself that you that you compute uh, could, in principle, be infinite. So could come out infinite. Uh, now, this is usually seen as a problem simply because you expect that when you go out there and do a measurement in real life, you don't get infinity. Mm. So it's not a number. I mean, infinity is not a number, it's not a quantity uh, that we normally say uh, co would correspond to any given result of a physical measurement. Yes. So if, if the question is as general as, uh, can there be something truly infinite in, uh, in, uh, in, the na in nature? Well, it could be, but then uh, it would not be directly seen uh, as the result of a measurement. For example, uh, for all we know in cosmology, we could actually uh, be living in a flat uh, Friedman universe. Okay, there is an acceleration, so it's more likely something like the Sita. But okay, suppose that it was a flat uh, solution, a flat Friedman. So the specially flat. Yes. For all we knew, that could be infinite. Right? There's no reason to assume that the whole universe as such, or the spatial universe is finite in volume. Yes. So in that sense, uh, our model will tell us that uh, the universe is infinite. However, it's not that uh, you go out, uh, uh, do observations uh, in uh, cosmological perturbation theory or you know, the CMB spectrum, or uh, I don't know, the, the, any measurement in your room or in your lab and you know, you, you, what you get is infinite. It's just that, uh, you know, your, your best understanding of uh, the universe is uh, involving some particular quantity, say the spatial volume, being possibly infinite. Right. But I, I, would, I would distinguish that from actually making oh, a measurement and getting infinity. Because that is, I mean, I don't see in what sense it can be said to be the result of a measurement be not a number so actually the the object is but that's not a different story I mean, it's, it's not it's, uh, it's the measured it's the measurement that we do on the well universe. somehow you have to tell me in your formalism what is supposed to correspond to the things you measure huh. and uh, what is actually some ingredient in the in the, in a model that could be real in some sense uh, could be hmm. you know attributed to the world but uh, it's not directly the result of a measurement I see, I see. And okay. uh, from a physical point of view, it's hard to put things which in your model are strictly speaking infinite uh, in correspondence mm. with the physical measurements. Mm. But that's a different point. I mean, there could be a lot of uh, aspects of the model which are infinite or infinite dimensional in like one way or another. But, uh, in, and probabilities that you, by definition, 
can be at most one <laughs> by definition of probability. So if you say I have a quantum theory of gravity and uh, which more or less works like any quantum theory and any observable is assigned a probability and that's the result of measurements in a sense, or, well, many measurements if you take a frequentist approach to probability, well, that is a finite number. Right. And that's all the results of measurements. Right. All, yeah. all, the, all the things that you actually put in correspondence with uh, physical observations. Anyway, this is a different uh, discussion. I mean, this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just thank I, you. Thank I you. I have one more question. Um, yeah, yeah. How about renormalization approach in this kind of whenever you find some uh, infinity? How about any renormalization approach in this context? Ah, okay. So, are you the context? You mean specifically tensorial group field theories, or you're asking in general if you have uh, infinities in your quantum gravity approach, uh, how renormalization is uh, uh, involved? In general. Okay. So. So normally. Uh, renormalization should be understood, uh, I would say, as uh, uh, dealing in a controlled manner, allow you to deal in a controlled manner with quantum interactions and quantum dynamics of an increasing number of degrees of freedom. The fact that we associate that to high energies or UV in usual physics has to do with the fact that we count the degrees of freedom in terms of uh, uh, distance or energy scales. But in fact, uh, you know, the notion of renormalization has to do with uh, how many degrees of freedom you're taking into account in your dynamics. Now, divergences in usual field theory, uh, the, the way I understand them, are basically signaling that uh, um, new processes become dominant the more you go at high energies, so the more you include in your description um, additional degrees of freedom, so more degrees of freedom of, the, uh, of your theory. Now, in itself, I wouldn't say that uh, if you find something which is infinite, you need to renormalize, because it would, it would, to me it would look like uh, making violence to the actual no physical notion of renormalization, what it gives, what it means. Now, Having said that, I can go back to the answer I gave to your colleague. I mean, if, uh, if you compute a quantity in a given formalism that you expect to correspond to a physical measurement, to some physical observable, and that uh, turns out to be infinite, for the same reason I said that uh, I wouldn't expect a measurement to give me infinity as an answer, then it means that there is some form of uh, regularization of the way I computed the quantity in my formalism is needed. But I'm not sure that I would call this, uh, you know, re regularization procedure uh, that may be needed at the mathematical level to make sense of, of a calculation. I would call it a uh, renormalization. Because to me, it would not have necessarily that uh, physical meaning. So this is in general. Then, uh, you know, uh, in, in the particular case of tensorial group field theories, uh, because you're dealing at least formally with uh, more or less standard uh, uh, quantum field theories, although not defined on space-time, but uh, more abstract, well, renormalization plays uh, the same uh, crucial role that it plays in usual uh, local quantum field theories on space-time. Not, you can say that it serves the purpose of dealing with the divergences of the dynamics, but as I said, it serves the purpose really of telling you uh, what, are, what is the phase diagram of the theory. What happens when you really fully take into account all the quantum uh, dynamics of the theory. And, uh, and, and allows you to fully compute quantities uh, that yes, come out finite, but uh, uh, come out uh, finite because you manage to consistently take into account uh, all the degrees of freedom that enter the um, evaluation of the quantity, that enter certain, the consideration of a certain process. Mm 
It's a physical statement. It's not a statement just about the mathematical infinity. That's mm -hmm. what I would like to distinguish. And formally, it plays the same role in uh, tensorial group field theories as it does in, uh, in usual uh, quantum field theory. Yeah, sorry, very, very long answer for a shorter question, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I, I just have one question and then you switch to the part four. So since you are talking about this tensorial field theories, mm -hmm. so is this uh, somehow connected with the prescription given by Gurau, Witten? Uh, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I call tensorial group field theories is a, is a broad framework. I try to be, how to say, I try to use a name that doesn't upset anybody working in the community. <laughs> uh, uh, so tensorial group field theories is uh, uh, a framework within which uh, you can then identify what is often called group field theory that come from a certain, uh, a certain history okay. and usually refer to a certain subset of models. Okay. Uh, from, uh, you can distinguish uh, tensor models or random tensor models, which yeah. are a generalization of matrix models. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and those are the ones that are used in the context of the SYK system. Yeah, yeah, that's why I love tensor. Yeah, actually many of the tools uh, like the large N expansion, the coloring, uh, the melonic diagrams that uh, uh, Razvan, uh, well, Ural, uh, introduced uh, for uh, tensor models mm -hmm. and now are used in uh, SYK models have been first introduced uh, by Razvan uh, with some help uh, of other friends uh, in, uh, in the context of group field theory. So uh, that's why, I mean, it's not that you need to distinguish uh, too strictly all these type of models. There is a framework with a number of sort of defining features and then uh, depending on which specific model you want to study or class of models, Okay. Then I uh, know you, you, it has certain applications, certain uh, uh, tools and results for others, but not only, uh, so to answer briefly your question, not only is related, but we are talking about the same uh, framework and the same type of uh, models. And then I can tell you more precisely what the distinction is between the models defined, uh, labeled in a different manner. Okay. Now you can continue. Oh, uh, if there are no more questions. And if you're not tired, then uh, I can tr I can say something more about the technical, slightly more technical part. Okay, uh, I guess you're not tired. Uh, I don't know how you manage. Okay, to continue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so let me take now a particular class of models within this tensorial group field theories uh, framework. And I introduce uh, some elements. Again, here, the, the key point is not, uh, the important point is not to fully understand the, the details, but I want to convey the main uh, messages, the main steps, but I'm dealing with the uh, more technical material. So before you consider quantum gravity or more uh, general quantum gravity formalism, you can ask uh, simply the question, if I have a single building block of a three-dimensional discrete space, for, uh, in particular a single tetrahedron, the, the object in the picture, you know, a single, take it as a building block of a three-dimensional lattice, a, P, a little uh, Lego blocks, Lego block. What could be, uh, how do I describe, how can I describe the intrinsic geometry of such an object if it was embedded in, uh, in flat space? Well, you can show that uh, it can be described by four vectors that you can think of as the normals to the uh, four faces, to the four triangles on the boundary of the tetrahedron. And these four vectors have to be subject with, uh, to uh, two constraints two sets of constraints. One uh, is, uh, uh, sorry, one is the condition that uh, for a given normal to the tetrahedron in a four dimensional space, uh, these four vectors are all orthogonal. And this is basically the statement uh, that the tetrahedron should lie in a three dimensional hypersurface of a four dimensional space. So in this sense is a three dimensional object embedded in a four dimensional one. Then you can you have to impose that the four vectors close, so they sum to zero. 
this corresponds to the statement that the four surfaces to which each vector is normal uh, close to form the boundary of a cell of a, of a, of a tetrahedron. Now, so in practice, you have uh, four three dimensional vectors, so elements effectively of uh, R3, uh, subject to these conditions. And then you can notice that uh, R3 is isomorphic as a vector space to SU2, the algebra of uh, the rotation group. And you can think of this uh, SU2 as part of uh, the phase space given by the cotangent bundle of SU2 or SO3 if you just take the, not the double cover, but the rotation group proper. So in a sense, you can say that I have a phase space associated to a classical tetrahedron, which is four copies of the cotangent bundle of the rotation group. So you're basically completing the uh, variables that define the intrinsic geometry of the tetrahedron with the corresponding uh, uh, conjugate variables. And because the uh, intrinsic geometry is given in terms of uh, the algebra SU2 variables, the conjugate variables are going to be group elements in the same group, subject to constraints, to the constraints uh, I gave earlier. So you can consider more generally a system built out of uh, d copies whose classical phase space is given by d copies of the cotangent bundle of a group of your choice, a Lie group. The moment you quantize, uh, you get a Hilbert space for, uh, corresponding to such a uh, phase space for a single tetrahedron, one representation for which would be uh, as an L2 space of functions over d copies of the group manifold with the scalar product given by the R measure. And it will go to constraints on such states uh, being the counterpart to the quantum level or the classical constraints uh, at the top of the slide. So this is the Hilbert space for a single tetrahedron. If you choose the group to be SU2, or if you want the Lorentz group, because you can show that those constraints can also be understood as specifying an embedding between uh, the cotangent bundle of the Lorentz group and the cotangent bundle of the, uh, sorry, the, the embedding of the cotangent bundle of the rotation group into the cotangent bundle of uh, the Lorentz group, SO31. If you have uh, a single, uh, the Hilbert space for a single tetrahedron, you can write down if you want a Fox space. You just several copies of the, the tensor product of, uh, of uh, a single quantum, single tetrahedron. Hilbert space will describe a system of many tetrahedra. And then you can have a, a is fluctuating. There is, is there is any analogy with the condensed matter system, many body system? Yeah. Well, this is a quantum many body system. Oh, okay. Just that uh, the single body we're talking about uh, as a, a geometric interpretation as a single tetrahedron. Okay. But I've given you a Hilbert space for a single quantum, okay. for a single body, and then I define the Fox space. Okay. And in fact, you can write down uh, creation annihilation operators, which are basically the field operators for such quanta. You can write down second quantized observables uh, coming from uh, the description of the geometry of individual tetrahedra and of many tetrahedra. In particular, I mean, I give you just one example. To each single tetrahedron, you can attribute a volume because you have a notion of uh, edge lens and uh, volume of the, of the cell. And then you can write down as an extensive quantity the total volume that you attribute to a state made of many tetrahedra, because it's just an extensive quantity, just sum over the single volume contribution from individual quanta. So in a sense, if I give you a quantum state for n tetrahedra, there is a clear sense in which I can say that I attribute to it a total volume being something you can compute. So in a sense, you, you can try to model space uh, at a quantum level as a system of many such uh, quantum polyhedra or tetrahedra. Of course, generic uh, states are not going to look very spacey, so to speak, so they don't have much of the properties you attribute to space. 
And uh, for example, the moment you start connecting them by gluing the tetrahedra to one another to form extended uh, discrete structures, then they already look a little bit more like uh, a discrete space. But a priori, you're still very far from any usual notion of geometry and, uh, and uh, especially continuum geometry. But then if you have a, such a quantum many body system described uh, in terms of field operators, you can go to a corresponding field theory by specifying an action for those field operators. Again, this precise form of the action will depend on uh, the model you prefer. And uh, you know, then it becomes an issue with model building and uh, studying specific implementations of the framework. But in general, there is one feature that will be true, which is what I call here a combinatorial non-locality. It means the following. It means that uh, the interactions will have to describe uh, uh, elementary processes in which uh, a certain number of uh, tetrahedra, for example, um, interact to form uh, some elementary building block of a four-dimensional lattice. So a tetrahedron is an elementary building block of a three-dimensional space. And uh, the dynamics uh, can be described in terms of processes which correspond to building blocks of four-dimensional space that are then connected to form a discrete uh, four-dimensional lattice. The dimensionality here is just the kinematical sort of uh, topological uh, dimensionality of the building blocks. Uh, it's not yet something you measure. In one large class of models, you can in particular consider the interactions in your action to correspond to five tetrahedra that uh, form the boundary of what is indeed an elementary building block of a simplicial lattice, uh, so a so-called four simplex. And this uh, specifies how the arguments of the field that correspond to the uh, phases of the tetrahedra should be identified with one another, following the pattern of, the, of identification of triangles across tetrahedra in the boundary of a four simplex which is in the picture on the bottom right. So this is a particular subclass of models, but it's clear that uh, this implies that uh, the interaction kernels should identify the arguments, uh, which are the variables, which are the arguments of the different fields entering in the interaction in a so-called non-local manner. They're not all identified with one another, but only in pairs. You, realize, you should realize here, if you know about uh, matrix models, that this is simply the higher dimensional generalization of matrix models. I, I say it for those who know, and the others can in fact uh, sort of forget about it for the following. There is a general implication of this uh, property of uh, interactions in uh, uh, tensorial group field theories. And it's the following, that uh, because of this, when you take the partition function of the full quantum theory with this type of fundamental interactions and you expand in Feynman diagrams, you will show that the Feynman diagrams correspond to elementary four simplices which are glued together in all sorts of ways and each way of gluing them will correspond to a particular Feynman diagram. And in fact, it corresponds to a particular four dimensional triangulation. So what you have uh, as a perturbative definition of the quantum dynamics of a tensorial group field theory is a sum over triangulations, each weighted by a Feynman amplitude. The next point is that uh, the Feynman amplitudes can be related uh, to the dynamics of loop quantum gravity states, but can also be written as uh, lattice gravity path integrals. So in this sense, uh, uh, you can find in this uh, framework, uh, the definition of quantum gravity suggested by loop quantum gravity, but also the definition of quantum gravity suggested by simplicial gravity approaches. With this definition, with these suggestions incorporated at, at the level of the perturbative dynamics of an underlying uh, more general uh, group field theory. Okay, 
Now, this is the general formalism, and I want to spend just three, four slides, I think, to give you one strategy that has been followed to extract uh, an effective cosmological dynamics out of this type of uh, uh, fundamental quantum gravity formalism. So if there are questions uh, to the formal part, uh, please ask now. Is there any question, guys? Please ask. Is the 4D theory that you talked about related to Crane-Yetter model? Or something oh. else. So, if you take uh, what is called, uh, uh, okay, okay, I tell you. If you take this, you take this action. You choose the group uh, to be uh, SU two. Huh. Choose the interaction to be simplicial. Then you expand your representations of the group. You switch, you rewrite the same action in, with the quantum deformation of SU2 at the root of unity. Mm -hmm. And uh, you choose the interaction kernel to be just a bunch of delta functions identifying yes. the pairwise, the, the arguments yes. of the field. Then the amplitude you associate to each uh, lattice generated as a Feynman diagram would be the crane yet uh, invariant. So that's just a special case. You, well, it's you a special model. Oh, it's one particular model you can write down. You would consider many other different models. Sorry, to say it again. Would you consider many other different models? Um, well, of course. I mean, the Cray Yetter model, uh, uh, if anything, corresponds to uh, topological BF theory in four dimensions. Oh. If, if you have to give it, if you want to give it some uh, continuum uh, space-time uh, description from what we know about the lattice uh, formulation, then it could be that, you know, something much richer comes out uh, from the full uh, sum of the lattices and so on, I don't know. But if you just look at the amplitude of the crane yet uh, model, mm -hmm. then you can put them in correspondence with the uh, uh, BF theory in four dimensions, which is a topological theory and is flat. Mm. In the case in which you have the quantum group, in fact, you know, you're right. It's actually, uh, you can interpret the quantum group as introducing a, a cosmological constant, so a constant curvature, mm -hmm. but it's still a very poor model for uh, you know, full four-dimensional gravitational physics. Ah, uh, okay. So it's, it's a lot of interest, uh, but, uh, but not, I don't think it would suffice to describe uh, quantum gravity in four dimensions. I see. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further question? Otherwise, he will move to the next section. And, and then I promise I close. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. So, suppose we want to extract uh, uh, cosmology out of this, out of a specific uh, model. Uh, it could be the Kranjeta, but uh, maybe some other model is more, uh, is more promising. Well, one hypothesis is that uh, the universe uh, can be seen as the result uh, in its uh, geometric uh, continuum uh, uh, pictures, uh, uh, features, uh, could, be, could be seen the result uh, as a condensation of the fundamental atoms, the fundamental quanta described by a tensorial group field theory, or in loop quantum gravity described by spin networks. So we need to control, uh, uh, you know, the large numbers of them. We have to find some appropriately uh, coarse grained uh, and approximate description. And then we, we need to show that uh, uh, the effective dynamics after such coarse graining has to do with the cosmology as we know it. So I first mentioned uh, uh, the main ideas. So uh, what goes under the name of uh, group field theory condensate uh, cosmology. So it can be shown that uh, condensates in this uh, uh, group field theory uh, formalism uh, admit uh, a good interpretation as a continuum homogeneous geometries. They are, because they are condensate, they are described by a single collective wave function, which is a function over the space of uh, homogeneous, in general, anisotropic geometric data. So this is the simplest type of uh, condensate, is a coherent state for the field. It is what corresponds to um, mean field hydrodynamics uh, or gross pitaski hydrodynamics in usual uh, Bose condensates. 
So you, you can write down this state in the full uh, group field theory formalism. You can show that the wave function that appears as a collective variable there is a function over a domain which, can, which is isomorphic to the mini superspace of homogeneous continuum geometries. So it's in fact the domain of, uh, for example, quantum cosmology or uh, the, sp the configuration space of uh, um, uh, the restriction of the general relativity to cosmology. Second, you can show that uh, if you extract an effective uh, hydrodynamic equation for such a state from a given group field theory model, uh, for which this geometric interpretation is uh, allowed, what you're going to get is a nonlinear extension of the usual quantum cosmology type uh, equation now expressed uh, for such a collective wave function of the condensate. So normally in quantum cosmology, you would have a wave function of the universe that is a wave function over mini superspace. What you get instead from group field theory in this hydrodynamic condensate approximation is a nonlinear extension of that equation in which you have a usual linear part, but then some nonlinear function, nonlinear part depending on some power of the um, cosmological wave function. And this, in fact, is extracted just as the Gross-Pitaeski hydrodynamics of a group field theory condensate. So we, uh, the main message is that indeed you can extract uh, an equation which has a cosmological interpretation as uh, the hydrodynamic approximation of the underlying uh, quantum gravity formalism. So is it like kind of a klein gordon equation type of thing? If by Klein-Gordon equation you mean uh, that it has, uh, you know, D'Alembertian as a kinetic yeah. term? Yeah. Well, there's, in some models it will have a D'Alembertian or a Laplacian on the group manifold in which your field is defined. Okay. Then some nonlinear term. But in general, yes, it's a scalar field equation just like any simple uh, hydrodynamics. Okay. And, um, in fact, uh, sorry, in fact, uh, the type of equation you get is basically the classical equation of motion of the underlying group field theory model. And uh -huh. as I've shown uh, earlier, the dynamics is given by some, uh, you know, the classical uh, uh, action for a scalar field, which is your field over the group manifold. Uh -huh. Just that it, it acquires uh, an interpretation as a field over, as a function over super, mini super space. Uh -huh. But technically it's a scalar field theory. It yeah. remains the equation, a classical equation of motion for a scalar field theory. Okay, so this is general. Now I, I tell you something more in two slides about one specific model. You can pick up uh, a, a model that is called EPRL in the loop quantum gravity literature, which is a model that uh, is supposed to describe Lorentzian quantum gravity in four dimensions using SU2 data. You add uh, an additional real variable to the domain of the field, which has the interpretation uh, motivated by discrete uh, gravity as a, um, a sort of a discretized uh, and, and then quantized free massless uh, scalar field. Then we reduce uh, the domain of the wave function, this collective wave function sigma that I introduced in the previous slide, to uh, the case in which you only have uh, uh, equilateral tetrahedra, which basically corresponds to an isotropic description from the point of view of cosmology. So you're going to deal with a very simple function of uh, one single representation label of SU2, basically a spin, J, and uh, the additional real variable that you interpret as a scalar field. The equations you obtain for the hydrodynamics take uh, the, the, the form there for this specific model with coefficients which are actually functions of the representation J, A, B, and W, which uh, characterize the model. You don't need to know more about uh, them at this stage. So, so you see it's a nonlinear equation, which is a function of uh, a representation label. We will see that that is basically the interpretation of a quantized uh, scale factor and the scalar field phi. 
So it's like a, if you take only the first two terms in the equation, it would be like a quantum cosmology equation for a wave function sigma, depending on the scale factor j and the scalar field uh, phi. But then it has a nonlinear contribution that comes from the interaction of the underlying uh, uh, quantum field theory. In the first approximation, you can take these interactions to be subdominant. And then you can take this uh, um, dynamics and uh, rewrite it in terms of observables with some geometric uh, uh, physical interpretation. One is the total volume of the universe at a given value of the scalar field that you use as a clock, is what I call V phi. And with respect to the same scalar field, you can also write down uh, the momentum of the scalar field, the energy density of the scalar field, still in expectation value in the condensate state. So th the details, again, are not particularly important. What I want to emphasize is that uh, you compute observables in the fundamental theory only assuming that uh, you are now, that your relevant state in which you want to extract and study the dynamics of such observables is the simple condensate state and therefore, the uh, relevant uh, approximation to the dynamics is the hydrodynamics, the mean field hydrodynamics. But the calculations are done in the full theory. Then these are the equations you obtain for the volume. So the prime uh, is the derivative with respect to your clock, so your scalar field. So these are like uh, uh, deparametrized or uh, relational uh, evolution equations for the volume, or if you want, for the scale factor. And there are two, so the equations are rather complicated. E and Q are some conserved quantities uh, for, resulting from the dynamics. Again, the details do not matter. Two points matter because they're rather general. One is that uh, if you take a classical approximation, you go and study what happens at late times, large volumes, time being the, the clock and scalar field, you find, in fact, uh, the uh, uh, approximately um, the, the, uh, you find approximately the Friedman equations with a certain identification of the parameters of the model with an effective cosmological constant. Uh, sorry, with an effective gravitational constant, neutral constant. So, from this point of view, at least in this approximation under these assumptions, you have a nice uh, classical continuum limit. Second, maybe more interesting. So the first is a consistency check. Second, you take the same dynamics and you ask instead what happens at early times. Well, what you find is that within this hydrodynamic approximation, within the mean field approximation to hydrodynamics, you find generically a quantum bounce. So whatever is the exact state, you find the bounce solving the classical singularity. Okay, and then there are very many other results that have been obtained in this uh, context. So I, I may refer you to the literature if, you, if you're interested. And I, I want to close with a, a comment on uh, what happens to the classical singularity in this specific uh, uh, derivation of cosmology from a, one particular full quantum gravity formalism because it's interesting and because in fact it's, it's a type of question we can address. We can address uh, in, 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 uh, in a, a concrete manner. So we found that there is a bounce, which is great because it's what has been found also in other approaches like uh, loop quantum cosmology, but now we found it within a, a more uh, fundamental uh, formalism. However, I emphasize we found it in a mean field restriction of the hydrodynamic approximation and within the assumption of a condensate phase of the underlying system. So we assume we were dealing with a condensate state as the relevant uh, state chosen by the dynamics. So do we found, uh, do, is it a big bounce that replaces the cosmological singularity in, uh, in the world? Well, we need to improve the mean field approximation but it could well be that uh, this bouncing scenario is going to be shown to be stable under such improvements of the dynamics. Then yes, if that is the case, you know, we find all the rel needed improvements of the various approximations and we still find that the hydrodynamics work, the hydrodynamic regime is, uh, can be trusted in, that, uh, in those physical uh, uh, situations, like the early universe, 
and uh, that we still find the quantum bounds. That is great. Then yes, there is a bouncing scenario produced by quantum gravity. However, we need to uh, us, we need to show that the hydrodynamic approximation still holds and that the system remains in a condensate phase. But it could well be that the dynamic approximation breaks down and that the, uh, you know, the breaks down because, uh, you know, fluctuations become too big relative to the quantities you are actually computing, quantum fluctuations. Then what happens with the singularity is, sorry, is, uh, well, the theory will be telling us that uh, the dynamic description in which we have some notion of smooth space time described by usual cosmology breaks down and we have to resort uh, to the more fundamental theory in which you do not have that description and you have to deal directly with the pre-geometric non-spatial temporal uh, building blocks. So I would call this scenario the disappearance of continuum space time. But in this case, we will still be within the uh, phase, uh, the condensate phase, uh, within which in the hydrodynamic approximation, we find space time. So it may break uh, at the singularity, but we still have a nice geometric description and maybe general relativity in, uh, uh, within the hydrodynamic approximation. So it's still a spatial temporal phase in this sense. However, it could well be that the fluctuations are such that not only they break the hydrodynamic approximation, but they also drive the system towards the phase transition, so towards criticality. Then the system will go out of uh, what I just called uh, a spatial temporal phase, and then we're going to be to find a system that uh, when we go towards the singularity, what would be the classical singularity actually moves uh, towards uh, a totally non-spatial temporal phase of the underlying uh, uh, quantum gravity theory. And so I just called it, uh, in absence of a better word, uh, a geometrogenesis uh, scenario or simply an even more radical disappearance of continuum space-time. And now I really close. So these are the three scenarios. And uh, I conclude with a quote by Einstein. Uh, I feel compelled to do that. Uh, that's, uh, that basically was saying uh, it could well be that at some point we totally have to drop any notion of space-time uh, and in particular the space-time continuum. And this corresponds to what I said at the very beginning that uh, we have to learn to think without uh, space and time. But he says uh, such a program looks like an attempt to breathe in empty space. So fundamental is uh, the notion of space and time for our thinking about the world. And I, I, I try to convince you that at least we're learning slowly to breathe in empty space. Thank you. Yeah. So we have to clap for Daniele for giving a very in elaborative talk and like he actually have covered almost everything so please unmute yourself and ask for him and uh, maybe if you have any question you can ask but before that i want to ask one more thing so uh, like uh, uh, you should be the last yeah no i i i, I know that <laughs> yeah i yeah, just I, I want to ask that uh, uh, you have mentioned about this hydrodynamical uh, coarse graining. So this coarse, coarse graining depend on some certain length scale? Well, it doesn't depend on length scale. It's a coarse grain in the sense of uh, uh, hydrodynamics. So in the sense of uh, choosing uh, a quantum state uh, or uh, an approximation of the quantum dynamics that uh, effectively taking, takes into account uh, a large number of degrees of freedom, okay. but in terms of a collective uh, variable. I, I give you an example uh, more concretely. So uh, even though this condensate state here, uh, you see it on your, on your screen? Mm -hmm. This uh, this uh, condensate, uh, which is the simplest condensate state you can write down, uh, even for standard uh, Bose condensates. Mm -hmm. So this is clearly not a realistic approximation to the full, uh, you know, ground state of a, of a quantum many body system, even if it is indeed a condensate, mm -hmm. because it neglects uh, all sorts of correlations between uh, the the atoms. Mm 
But if you look at it, it's a, an infinite superposition of an infinite number of atoms, all with the same wave function. So, but all of this infinity of degrees of freedom, <laughs> somebody died. <laughs> I heard a strange noise. Is everybody okay? <laughs> All right, anyway, so I was saying that if you expand this exponential in a power series, you will realize that it is a power series in a number of particles. Yeah. And so it contains an infinite number of terms that go up to the largest possible number of fundamental atoms. So in a superposition. So this is an infinite superposition of an infinite number of degrees of freedom. However, it is collectively described by a single function, the sigma. Okay. So in this sense, uh, is a coarse graining. In the, so in the same sense in which when you write down the aerodynamic equation for a, for a quantum many body system, you have an equation for a single function, which is basically your field, your density of the fluid or your, the velocity of the fluid. These are the two hydrodynamic variables, which collectively in a coarse grain manner are encoding all the interactions of the uh, very large number of molecules or atoms uh, that constitute your system. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, approximating away all sorts of uh, details and uh, actual properties of the system. So it's a, it's a drastic approximation. Thank you. Uh, so guys, you can ask question now. Oh, I can, maybe I should, should I read the chat? Somebody is saying something, probably. Uh, uh, wait, randomization I answered uh, earlier, I think. Somebody is thank uh, yeah, just 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 uh, just ask uh, by microphone is more effective. Yeah, as if it was an ordinary seminar in ordinary room. Yeah, where is it? I lost you. I oh, know you're back there. Let me slides. Hey, there were many questions before. Anyway, so it's not that uh, we had a lack of uh, questions. Yeah. So I think everybody is tired. <laughs> including Daniele. Probably you have given uh, the most elongated talk in your career. Two and a half hours? Oh, don't underestimate me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have, a, I have a, um, known to run over time. So. No, no I, I don't care about that, but I'm saying that like, uh, I think this Anyway, is I hope that uh, the, the, the material was at least partially understandable. Then, uh, then I'm free to. I'm happy to answer more questions by email or in chat uh, yeah, at some yeah. other point. So I will uh, I, uh, upload this in YouTube. Okay. So I will share the link with you as well, and okay. you can see all of you can see in my channel that this talk will be uploaded by today, and you can actually go through and write to Daniele if you have any really problem with some material. So thank you for your time and such a nice elaborated talk. And I am hopeful that it is helpful for everyone. And uh, have a nice time, be safe and healthy. And hopefully things will be perfect soon. Thank you, have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank bye you, bye. everyone.